Good morning, everyone, um, both in the room and uh, in our vast um, internet audience, I'm sure. I'm welcoming you to Day to Day 2015, and we have a bunch of great presenters in the room and a bunch of hungry listeners who want to learn cool things that they can do with data. Um, so um, you, if you want to tweet out today's uh, events, um, use just the hashtag Day to Day, hashtag Day to Day, um, and I'll be following um, the the, t the feed on Twitter. So without further ado, I present Ali Dupuis, Dupuis <laughs> of Find the Best. Okay, awesome. great. Thank you. And thanks for having me. Uh, so as I gave a little intro earlier, my name's Ali and I head up partnerships and operations for our data visualization program. Find the Best at its core is a research engine and we aggregate data on thousands of different topics, but then we spit that data out into millions of embeddable data visualizations for publishers. So, yeah, am I presenting on... Yeah, we have to also <laughs> present it to the... To the oh. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how they're going to see my presentation. <laughs> We're all worried about people online. <laughs> I don't think we have to worry about There's sound. No we just have to worry about the... Oh, do we have a cable? I can hold it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we need a BGA. Yes, we do. Oh, shoot. Um, do you have one? Okay. Not sure. Stephen, bring that with his bow. I think I have one. Yeah, I have a GBI. Those work? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Remind us to give that back to you, but you're staying till the end of the day, right? Okay. You remembered it, so yeah. Don't try this at home, folks. It's way too complicated. Okay, Ooh, yeah, well, that's going to be right. Does this have to be set up for mirror or something? No, I don't think it's. It's on presentation, so it should work. It's going to just take whatever's on that screen. And you, you control it from there? Okay. There we go. It's promising. There we go. Wonderful. Yay. Yay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Magic. Wow. And we did it without a net. Okay. <laughs> Great. Can you all see from where I'm standing? Promise. Okay. So as I was saying, we aggregate data on thousands of different topics, from smartphones to colleges to congressional campaign committees. And we pull that data from a variety of different sources. So we kind of have two arms of our business, this user-facing research engine that consumers can use to compare a smartphone or a car or gather data on every company in the world. And then we have this publisher program and product that allows you to grab all of that data in bite-sized embeddable data visualizations um, straight into your article or page. And so this side of our business, we reach about 30 million visitors to, per month to our actual research engine. And then uh, publishers, we, ha we have a huge variety of publishers that we work with and we're starting to reach about 20 million users a month through those articles that we're syndicating to. We like I said, we curate data on a bunch of different topics, and that lends to uh, our partnerships in various different verticals. So in the financial world, we're working with Zach's Investment Research and Xignite and a variety of licensed data sets. Uh, consumer products, usually working off of a manufacturer's website, we have a, team, a product team that curates data and grabs it from an actual product website and throws it onto our site. And then from government uh, reports, so government databases, the DOE, Bureau of Labor Statistics, a variety of public data sets that are open to the public, but probably very hard to read and uh, you know, digest for, for the average American or average publisher. 
Um, and then more. We have a lot of data sets that we work with that are very custom, um, but we're always trying to find the most ideal data set for a certain topic, the most authoritative and the one that we can curate, cleanse, and pop out in a real user-friendly manner onto our site. And so what that translates to is these millions of embeddable data visualizations that are pre-made on our site across all of our different categories. So we have a topic on companies, and that topic has an earnings chart for every public company that we feature on our site. And our platform really allows us to ingest that data and then dynamically pop out all these data visuals for each individual entity and the to on a topic level as well. So we kind of like to consider ourselves as the Getty images of data visualizations because that kind of makes sense to the publishing world. You're going to Getty images to grab or a stock image provider to grab a photo for your article. Why not be able to grab a data visualization that backs up and supports your uh, research and your article's main thesis? This is just an example on one of our publisher sites. We work really closely with Gannett and USA Today. And so we're able to pull in a lot of these topics that publishers are writing about on an ongoing basis. So commodities, indexes, in the financial world, earnings, a lot of these uh, refreshing events that on a daily basis may be a news story. Um, and all of our data visualizations auto-update and auto-refresh. So if you're grabbing a code and throwing it into an article, the next day when that oil price comes in, it auto-refreshes into the visual. And so prior to this year, we uh, were focusing a lot on a research engine. And now the company has kind of transitioned to throwing a lot of resources at this data visualization product. So we've actually built out a universal search for our library of data visualizations. And I'll walk you through that in a, in a second. Um, but everything is accessible from this one page search. It is in beta right now, and so you're not going to be able to really use it yet. But in a few weeks, it'll be open to all publishers. Uh, worldwide, and they'll be able to, you will be able to pull any data visualization that you want from our library for free and embed it onto your site. This search works in a variety of ways. We have a trending home page, which I'll show you in a second, um, that'll aggregate and curate all of the trending news that's happening, any visualization that we have that applies to current news and current events. And then we allow you to actually search with keywords, uh, search with an a full article URL, or plug in your entire text of an article to our search, and it'll contextually recommend uh, data visualizations to you. So this is just going to walk you through a couple example searches. Let's say you're a sports editor writing about the Cavs. You would just search a keyword, and it would pop up with any sort of information we have available. Similarly, we do a lot of comparing, so comparisons between individual entities, compar comparisons between companies, individuals, we're able to throw those side by side in this kind of uh, comparable format that allows you to look at the stats right next to each other. And then we have a lot of localized data. We have a product that actually curates demographic information on all of the geographies in the U.S on a local level, all the way down to the zip code level, and all the way up to the national level. So states, counties, cities, et cetera. And then our company's product is pretty uh, breadthy and has a lot of information as well. Colleges, another one of our big topics. Uh, we have a lot of information on education, college tuition, et cetera. Cool. So I'm going to walk you through this search really quickly offline, or online, off the presentation. Should take me there. Nice. Lovely. Does that look good on the screen? Yep. Great. So as I said, this is in beta. It'll be available in a few weeks to all publishers. Um, you can access this link right now, but it is a beta search, so I wouldn't go too crazy with it. And it'll only be available to our publishing partners over the next two, two weeks as we uh, gather feedback. Oop, what did I just do? So as I said, we have this trending graphics section that'll be on the home page, and we'll curate any trending graphics that we have around current news events and big events happening at the moment. So as you can see, as you know, the Oscars just happened. We had various visuals on Best Picture nominees and how their budget compared to the revenue at the box office. 
The Pebble Time Watch just launched, as some of you may know. Um, so we have smartphone graphics that show all the stats on this individual product, as well as compared to its largest competitor at the moment, the Apple Watch. Um, moving on to company earnings constantly releasing. Like I said, we have all of this data that refreshes. And so when HP released their earnings, this visual instantly popped up in our trending queue with the uh, Q4 earnings amount. And then anything else that's happening currently, um, the U.S. budget has been a big topic of discussion as well as any 2016 presidential candidates. So this section will kind of be a go-to place for publishers to see, hey, this is something that's really big right now in the news, and here's a data visualization to supplement that content. Moving on to the keyword search, let's say you were looking for something on Target since they just released earnings and have been in the news lately. You would be able to just type in a keyword and have any visuals we have related to that company pop up. A stock price and volume. A uh, visual, quarterly PS, earning surprise, an overview, stat, visual, government contracts, executives, etc. Let's say you wanted to get a little bit more local and find any information we have on Montclair, New Jersey. That's where we are today. It'll pop up with plenty of information on. Um, Montclair, New Jersey in general. Um, so stats we have on demographic information, average commute time, total population, real estate markets, transportation, local schools, etc. Any questions on this product before I pop back into the Presentation. Do you see people using it to find visuals for stories they're already creating or a place where they can find interesting things to write a story about? So we currently work with publishers in both ways. Uh, the main way we work with publishers is driving content. So you may be writing a story on um, a certain company or a certain locale and you want to know something about the restaurant uh, environment in that locale, or you want to know something about the economic demographic there. Um, and we'll work closely with publishers to pair them with any graphics that we have for that big story that they're writing. We also like to drive content in the sense that we're constantly aggregating data, and so we see insights a lot of the time that could drive a story. And we have a program that I'll speak to at the end of my presentation that allows us to send out any insights that we see that are applicable to your beat or your uh, kind of categories. But we also work with publishers post facto. So let's say you've already written a story and you want to add a visualization. It's really easy for you to put that article URL into the search or just ping it over to our team and say, hey, this story's out, but I know it's going to get a lot of traffic over the next week, so I want to kind of spiff it up and add a visualization to it. Anything else? Great. So I was just talking about how we drive in uh, content through insights that we send out to our publisher um, network. We have an entire team dedicated to developing our publisher relationships and helping drive content for online publishers. So we have an, a personal and email alert system that not only sends you, hey, you work in tech and this is this trending um, new product that came out, here's a visual for that product, we also create charts of the week or interesting facts of the week that we turn into data visualizations and send directly to your inbox so that you can create a story or an article off of that. Um, we have three main uh, trending email alerts that we actually send out to publishers. The first one being news and events. So relevant charts on what's happening today. Earnings releases, a product gets released, that'll be in your inbox with a paired graphic. We also have charts of the week, which I was just speaking to. Uh, this can be on a local level, but it also, also can be on a national level. So we have a local heat map uh, weekly chart program where we send to your individual locale a new interesting fact on that location every week. So I'll get to some examples of that in a second. And then new data and services. So anytime new data is aggregated onto our platform or new features uh, are added to our data visualization suite, we actually alert you and let you know, hey, 
we just added all of this information. It's applicable to your beat of finance, and we thought you'd be interested to hear about it. Great. Uh, so hyperlocal lists and heat maps. Uh, on a weekly basis, we send out very interesting facts on a certain location to anyone that's interested. Um, so let's say you're looking at, you're from Miami and you're a local newspaper there. We're able to aggregate data on that locale and send out, this is the, the bars per capita in your location and the top 10 zip codes that have the most bars per capita. Uh, moving on to how many people are single in each county in Georgia. Um, so a heat map that shows these are the most uh, married counties, and these are the ones with the most single people in them. And so, as you can see, this can drive a weekly story for a local uh, newspaper. And so we send this out on a weekly basis to all of our partners in uh, hyper-local places. I'll pop out and show you an example of this published on one of our publisher sites. So we work closely with the biz journals. Um, and every week, their locales publish one of our pieces or one of our data pieces around um, graphics that we send them. So this one was on the most, the wealthiest areas in in Sacramento. And as you can see, this is that graphic I was just showing a screenshot of with a heat map and then a list of the top ten um, wealthiest zip codes in Sacramento with the population. And all of these are interactive, so you can kind of come play, your users can play around with the graphic and see what the data actually entails. Awesome. And then beyond that, the other service our program kind of encompasses is this custom request uh, arm. I'm not talking, hey, I'm writing a story on this, can you build a chart here? But let's say you were writing a story and you had no idea if we had a certain visual or you saw a visual but you wanted it maybe tweaked a little bit. We have a team standing by ready to field those requests. So we have a Chrome plugin. How it works is you download it to your browser and when you're on the article URL that you are wishing to, to talk about or send over to our team, you just click on that little Chrome plugin and type a message, hey, I'm looking for a chart on, I know you guys have a lot of hyperlocal information and I want information on uh, schools in Georgia. Send that over to our team and we'll respond within an hour with an email, either a graphic that uh, responds to your request or saying, hey, we don't have that information, but let's work with you to uh, add that in the future. Can I ask a question? Sure. So how do you, you do this for only registered uh, users, do you have to do you have to prove that you're a publisher? Uh, how, who gets the service? It's not just your so our program is for publisher partners that we work with. The mm -hmm. search is for anybody, anywhere, any small blogger, any individual person just looking to embed a data visual onto their site. Um, so that search, once it's available in the next couple weeks, will be o o completely open source. Um, but these kind of more in-depth services we provide to our publisher partners. So people that we're working with on an ongoing basis, um, they're using our data visualizations in stories consistently and we're able to kind of create a working relationship with them. So would you accept hyperlocals into that? Or Definitely. So, so if you're serious about using the visualizations, mm -hmm. you would be accepted into the network. So your publisher, your, yep. your real new site, Absolutely. Your small one. Absolutely. Okay. We don't. <laughs> and how do you do that? How do you, how do you So I was going to ask if after this I can get everyone's email and I can send out a survey. It'll ask you what of these alerts you want to receive. So the hyperlocal weekly heat map I'm assuming is going to be um, popular, but also alerts for national news graphics, etc. I can send out a survey on that. We'll add you to uh, the database and then from there you can d download the Chrome plugin right now and start pinging our team. Let me ask you a question. Is it, is every, did everybody in this room sign in and register for Eventbrite? Anybody who didn't? Okay. Or is, or is it presenter? I don't, I don't know if I did. If you're not a presenter, <laughs> if you're a presenter or yeah. either a presenter or you sign in for Eventbrite, does anybody object to having Ali um, write you with this information? 
it'll just be a survey with about three questions okay, on it. So, so it'll be super I, easy. If then with everybody's permission, I will send the emails of all the presenters and all the registrants. Perfect. Yep. That works. And then with that, I can send out the survey, this Chrome plugin download link, <coughs> and the widget search page, the visual search page as soon as it's ready. Cool. So that leads me to next steps. <laughs> Fill out survey, which we just <laughs> decided would be sent out. <laughs> Download the plugin. Um, explore the search tool when I provide the link to you guys. And then local heat maps get sent out every week. We also send a chart of the week every week. So if you sign up for a tech national chart of the week or a finance national chart of the week, we'll actually be sending that out weekly as well. Um, and give feedback. We love to hear what you guys like, what you don't like. Um, this is all free completely free. Uh, you can use this search and immediately embed into your own site. We have JavaScript and HTML uh, codes, so it works for a lot of different CMS systems. Um, and yeah, this email right here reaches me and my team of uh, data visual managers, so everyone who's curating the trending graphics and working with publishers on a daily basis. So. <laughs> To put you on the spot. I'm sure. not even going to say Absolutely. not to put you on the spot. To put you on the spot. <laughs> I love being put on the spot. <laughs> Could we generate some searches live here in this room of things that people want to see and just to see what you have? We can. I can tell you a lot more. I can search the site and show you. The actual visual search page is in beta still, so it doesn't have all of our content indexed. Right. So if you say something that isn't in the search yet, I may have to go onto the site and find it. But if you guys want to start throwing out examples of content you would want visualized, I can kind of walk you through it or show you something on site that would provide that. So do you part. have some for if for EWR? Uh, how about uh, plane crashes by airport? Don't have that information. Oh. Plane delays by airport. We have a lot of airport information. Let me show you that. Don't have plane crashes, though. I know it's been big, especially with all the uh, Malaysian airlines and all of that. And this is what we're trying to eliminate from a publisher's workflow is actually having to go to our user-facing website and search for data visualizations because it's not built for a publisher audience. It's built for a user researching an airport. Um, dun -dun -dun. So this is our airports topic. It aggregates data on airports worldwide. Can you see if there, can you search by airport code, like EWR, which is newer? I, yeah. I think so. We can go to that airport instead, since it's local. <laughs> We're excited about the search. It's been just a cog in our process for a while. It's just EWR. Oh. This one? Yeah. Flying out of here today. Uh -huh. Let's see how it stacks how, up. Yeah. <laughs> Weather delays. <laughs> what else we got? <laughs> what is this? What is it says, what's this? 66. We have a smart rating. We aggregate ratings from expert sources. So if there's ever an expert source in a certain field, so for tech, uh, PC world, or uh, CNET, we aggregate all those ratings and turn them into one rating so you can kind of look at the aggregate score of a certain um. So we have information on number of airlines, number of destinations, total passengers, terminal information, airport services, all of this is embeddable so you could pull a visual with any of this content in it. But we don't have much on airports beyond that. I think we have, uh, for other airports we might have. So that that's why. Um, you don't have that yet. No, no, no. You can, but it's practically impossible for me to um, show you without the visual search. Mm -hmm. So this would be just like a little overview widget. You could actually customize what information was in here. Um, Total passengers, terminal info, you would be able to pull that in. Mm 
number of lounges, food and beverage shops, etc. So this is kind of just an overview of the airport, mm -hmm. um, but we're not going to have plane crash data. Okay, so if you had this embedded on a hyper-local website, mm -hmm. would people be able to do what you just did and say, oh, I'd like to know how many lounges there are, and they click on it and the graphic would change? They wouldn't be able to do it from the actual visual, but you as a publisher would be able to customize it and pick which fields you'd, you'd put into the graphic. And that'll be available from our search page, so when you see a graphic, you'll be able to not only just pull it, we have the option to just pull the code quickly from that page for publishers or, or journalists that want to, don't really want to customize and just want to throw it on the page immediately. And then we have a more in-depth option which allows you to customize the information and fields that are provided. It's all free. It's all free. <laughs> are you able to do comparisons? Yes. So if you say if you wanted to do this, you wanted to compare the New York Liberty versus um, LaGuardia. LaGuardia. Absolutely. Or how would you do that? Bum, bum, bum. I don't know if this internet's going to be fast enough to do it from here. I'll do it from here. We can do so. Mm -hmm. Add to compare. Again, this isn't built for this. This experience you're seeing right now isn't built for publishers, and that's why we have the visual search page. But I I'll be able to to walk you through it since I know the site so well. So when is the visual search? Two yeah. weeks. In two weeks, and if you sign up with you, you'll, you'll get all the news about it. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So I'm gonna look for LaGuardia or JFK. Mm. What's the full name? Oh, it's all one word. There we go. <laughs> so you would add to compare, compare selected items, and then I could grab this embeddable visual. You see the rating for the two side by side. Uh huh. And you can customize the information just as you did with the profile of the one. And it shows the two side by side with all of the information. Supposedly, you work. And you can add information as well to this. So, customize information, add fields, etc. But again, this whole experience will be very different uh, for a publishing audience. Yeah? Um, I guess one question is, uh, how much is this optimized for mobile? It's completely responsive. Yeah. And the second question is, um, the underlying data sources that are mm -hmm. there, citation, where the data is collected, it's this little eye in the top right of every visual. It has the data source um, cited for each visual. And we'll have premium data providers like Dax Investment Research, which is a licensed data set, so we're paying for the data. And we'll put that in the bottom of the visualization, data by Zach's Investment Research, just because they have different um, citing requirements than a public data source. Yep. So all we need is that little created on find the best in the bottom right of the visual, um, which is required with every visual you embed, but that's that's all the citing that we require. Um, what if, for example, I've been writing a lot of videos, do you know what they're going to embed on medium? We should embed in any CMS system. We have a JavaScript option and an HTML iframe. They don't, but what I was going to ask, oh. I don't think you can because it's very good. What are you okay. talking about? But if you, we haven't worked if you did a screenshot and then a link, would that be adequate for you to screenshot? Yeah, I mean, we prefer the actual embedded visual because it's interactive, so you're right. going to lose all the interactivity mm -hmm. of it. But, um, yeah, as long as you're citing us, then uh, that mm -hmm. should work. We do have a, a WordPress plugin, so I don't know if Medium works in the same way where a plugin would allow you to embed. Um, but we are creating plugins for all of these systems that don't work with uh, your typical embed. Yeah. Are you able to compare, for example, um, let's say uh, graduation rates or special education? Yeah. Uh huh, definitely. On our public schools comparison, we have all graduation rates, 
Very yeah, very localized. And that's on our local product. So, and that's something you could use our Chrome plugin for. So, if you wanted to ping that over to my to my team and say, "Hey, I'm looking for this. I, I heard in the presentation that you have localized data. Do you have this? We'll get back to you within an hour with the visual if we do." Yeah. So you have a, a WordPress plugin. How does that work? So it's similar to this recommendation search that I was showing you. What it does is it contextually matches to uh, what you're writing any visuals that we have. I can show you a demo of it if you want to see. I think I know the URL. <laughs> um, cross your fingers, this works. Yes. So this is what it would look like on your CMS backend as you're typing an article, and it would just be a little icon in your writing dashboard that would allow you to click and find any recommended visuals that are contextually matched to your article text. Um, so if you went out of the page and you found it on the site itself, on the find the best site, you could just put the embedded link into your story any place and it would show up there. Yep. Um, the reason we built a WordPress plugin is because WordPress is really tricky. Mm -hmm. um, it just varies by uh, download year. <laughs> versions and what you have installed affects other things that are installed. So we built it a WordPress plugin to kind of solve all those issues. But within this plugin, you're able to search. So I could still do that same search that I'm doing on the search page within the plugin. And we're building the plugin for any CMS. So uh, eventually, it'll be available for any publisher that wants the, the search within their actual system and backend. So what if I wanted to find um, just yeah. Um, the cities in the United States that have the most yoga studios, just to get a sense of like what the most yoga stats are. So we actually have that information, weirdly <laughs> enough. Um, <laughs> For each of our cities, we aggregate uh, per capita bars, restaurants, and yoga studios, <laughs> as well as religious organizations. So uh, let's say, let's go to, where? what city in New Jersey would you want to look at? Oh, let's look at one place. <laughs> That's spelled correctly, right? Yeah. <coughs> County, subdivision, city, Upper Montclair. Let's go for it. I'm going to go to a state because you're actually going to be able to see every demographic information that we have, all the demographic information that we have. Let's do state, state, North Carolina. Let's see, like, I'm using North Carolina. Um, how many would you do? Who knows? <laughs> 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 you saw that right from today? see it on the non-employee site, but... Uh, but if I were registered with a video, I would have to... Yes. Yeah. If, you, if you sent this in a Chrome request, we'd have it for you. How do you download that Chrome document? It's just a link that I'll send out. It's a Chrome plugin link. Um, here, let me show you one that I'm sure it has on San Francisco. All these icons, it's yeah. telling it you what's heavy in this city. Oh. 
<laughs> best weather to worst weather. Um, this is all stuff that we can do. So the data is on our back end, so we can turn it into any sort of visualization that you want as long as we have the data available. So this is the local business. Hold on, I'm just going to show the, the local businesses really quickly. Oh, but this will show you how many per capita restaurants there are, restaurants by type. So Chinese is predominant, how many restaurants there are in the individual city, religious organizations, and then how many yoga studios. Wow. So to your, to your question. In comparison with the state as well as the nation. And is per capita, yeah. Um, just because it wouldn't make sense if you were just doing an aggregate count of uh, studios. But these are all embeddable, so I could grab this really quickly and say, hey, this is restaurant. This is restaurants by type in San Francisco. Actually, our localized heat map of this week was um, restaurants per capita in your locale. So what cities or zip codes have the most restaurants per capita in your locale? Um, and we can do this on a topic level. So we can rank, hey, these are the 20 cities in the US with the most bars or the most yoga studios. These are the most fit places because they have the most gyms per capita. If we have the data, we'll immediately do it. Um, if we don't have the data already, it'll have to be something that we'll use again and again with, with partners. So, for example, like Facebook is a, Facebook is a, um, you know, it's a site that is mm -hmm. If it's something that, that's interesting and that other publishers would use, 100%, yeah. Okay. So we're open to requests. It's just not a story one-to-one -one basis. It's not very scalable for us to work with publishers on a one-to-one -one story basis. Suppose we found uh, some data on that we that. Can you do that? Um, Let's say it's a government um, if it's a wide enough data set that applies to our site or topics that other publishers will be interested in, definitely. Um, it just can't be, like I was saying, something one to one. There's just so many chart builders out there that already do that or allow you to visualize data on a one-to-one -one basis that it doesn't make sense for us to really provide that service. Maybe in the future we might start having that arm, but not yet, yeah. Um, you had a question so a while ago. It sounded like you were saying earlier that the raw data is also available. Um, in some cases, yes. The problem is we license a lot of our data, so we have agreements with data providers um, that we're allowed to distribute our visuals in an embeddable manner, but not actually give the raw data out. Um, but a lot of our data is from government, public, open sources. We're not providing that in Excel sheets as of now, um, but we can work on it on a one-to-one -one basis and see if it's... Can Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, so we have a product team that their entire job is figuring out what's the most authoritative source, and if there are conflicts, looking at all the data sources and curating it into a kind of master, better source. For example, Dun & Bradstreet is our company's provider um, of our kind of filler company data. And there's always a lot of uh, issues with updates or having them um, work that go together with the, the other data providers that we're working with. So Zach's Investment Research has a lot of data. Um, you're going to see company earnings data is different from every provider that, that releases company earnings, right? Because the company reports something, and then they also have a before non-recurring items number, and so financial numbers can get very different across providers, but we use kind of the authoritative source in the vertical, and we figured that out after years of working with different publishers and figuring out what works, what's the best. Mm -hmm. Mostly curated from third parties. Um, we've started doing surveys. We're also starting to work with companies and our organizations like Pew Research that do their own surveying um, and working with them to ingest those uh, surveys and different data sets that they have. But we just released our first survey that we did in-house on credit cards. So um, starting to go in that direction, but it's not a big part of what we do yet. What about opinion? Um, so if we haven't yet, but um, like I said, starting to work with companies that do surveys and a polling, um, we're starting to get into that realm. It's a lot different uh, because it's a lot harder to tell what's right and what's uh, authoritative, but um, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the yeah, sure. Hmm? 
Um, our entire company is 150. Uh, we are in Santa Barbara, California, and um, my team of for data visualization specifically and working with partners is about 16 at the moment, but the product team is the majority of our company. So the actual members that work with the data sets and turn it into the research engine product and the data visualization. So, uh, so what we do is we go to the site and we register. Is that how it works? I'm going to send out an email to all of uh, yeah, it'll be a survey basically asking for what emails you want to get from our team, and it'll give you a link to the Chrome plugin, and then in two weeks when the search is ready, it'll be the search. Um, you don't need to go to findthebest.com and register or do any of that since that's our user-facing site. Um, I want you guys to um, We'll use your email to send you these kind of localized charts on a weekly basis or trending news and stuff like that. So if you've already if you're already registered or you're presented, don't worry about it. But if you haven't you slipped in the back of the room somehow, that's fine. Um, and I'll leave my business cards over here on this table, okay. just in case you guys want to take one. But you, can um, you say what your business model is? How do you guys make money from us? That's my favorite question. <laughs> um, so we make money off of our research engine. So we, we're just like any other publisher. We reach 20 million or 30 million users a month on that site, and so we we monetize through display ads and lead aggregation, etc. So it's just like having that entire business behind us, backing us, and then this data visualization product for three to stop it. My job easy. Um, <laughs> so yeah, thanks. Business cards over there. Sign up if you aren't registered. And if you are registered, I will get your email. Yeah, I'll send that out. It sounds like a great product. It's yeah. Really great. We're excited about this year. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Yeah. Good job. So we have a lot to fit in. We're actually ahead of schedule, which is amazing. <laughs> so let me introduce Martin Gonzalez, who is, um, I don't know, he's a block, is really what he is. He's a guy who loves data and started as a municipal bond analyst? Or? No, I'm a corporate bond. A what? Co a corporate bond. I'm a capital markets guy. So why don't you introduce yourself um, so you came in late and you can do that. But introduce yourself and then go into your presentation. Do you know yourself better than other guys? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, just, well, I'm uh, a financial analyst, but then I've, uh, the last few years I've just been uh, messing around, and one of the things that uh, caught my interest was uh, our township finances, and I try to do what analysts do is you try to create a spreadsheet that, that does pro forma, so you have to forecast it. Turns out municipal space, nobody does any real work in, in terms of substantive financial analysis. So I started looking at, at property records. Um, and they're particularly interesting because they drive uh, uh, the revenues for most townships. Um, so it turns out there's this very large data set uh, that has all the property tax records in New Jersey. It's about three million properties uh, per annum, and you uh, pull them down. It turns out there there there's a lot of garbage, so you can't you know nominally it's available to everybody, but you can't actually use it. Uh, and, and, it and there's some you know there's some some legitimate reasons for it, semi-legitimate. You know, the, the data is provided by the townships, and the townships have different computer systems. So some of them are throwing uh, out results in COBOL. So you get these really weird results. You have to build all kinds of scripts to clean the data. Um, uh, so I've uploaded, uh, and I've uploaded the last five years. That's all the data that's available. Just did the last set in the last week. Um, and then you can do a whole bunch of, uh, there's endless things you can do, whether uh, for personal interest or for business. The part that I'm interested in, uh, and to me for, um, for public interest, the part I'm interested in is the, the nature of, of public, uh, of municipal finance is uh, that you pay for goods according to the assessment of your house. So it's as if you went to the marketplace and you wanted to buy a car, and they said, well, how does your house compare to the other houses in your neighborhood? We have a big house. Well, your price is fifty thousand. Oh, you have a small house. Oh, okay, your car, your price of the car. So it's a very odd system we have, uh, and in theory it works because intergenerationally everybody takes turns with kids in the school system. It turns out people game it. So anyway, that's the whole basis for looking at this stuff. 
So we uploaded all this data, and this really only speaks to the to the ultimately the revenue side because that's the source of revenues. So this is the state of New Jersey. I don't know how to use these uh, these. Uh, uh, no, it's okay. It's uh, I mean I will in a second. So it ha so everything is organized first by counties. All the data is organized by counties and by year. And what is the color signify? Uh, we just they were just trying to uh, just the color signify something later on. Here it's just to distinguish the county, so it's oh, visually okay. obvious. Um, so we're in Essex. How do you click these things? So two clicks, one click. Oh, okay. You got hold on. It? No. Uh, so let's go. So we're trying to do this. Okay. So it's yeah. loading up. Uh, currently, it's loading up about uh, fifteen thousand records, and fifteen thousand records with about a hundred fields in each of them. So. Who knows if it'll load up? Hopefully, it'll load up uh, in a second, and that in turn will be hopefully color coded. And in this particular case, can you help me slide this thing down? <laughs> nope. Uh, well, okay. Let me sit next to you. It's my laptop. That's okay. Okay. I, there you are. So all this is what this is. Uh, the color coding here is uh, assessments. Uh, so property tax assessments from zero. To uh, over an uh, increments of deciles, up to fifty thousand uh, per um, uh, fifty thousand. So you can tell the sort of who's paying what. You can either do it by assessment levels, you can do it by tax levels. I have to like the tax levels. Um, so you can do things that are kind of um, uh, let's see, how do we drill in? What's the difference between tax level and assessment level? Here? I mean, the assessment level is just the nominally what is the property worth. Okay. And, the, and the tax rate is, you know, you know, zero three percent. Correct. Okay. And then but this is the actual bill taxes, right? This is not based on assessment. This is this is yeah. the actual. This is showing you. Yeah. This is this is the one and the same. So in other words, what you're assessed, what you pay. There's obviously there's plenty of properties that are exempt. You know, they have very high assessments, but they're exempt. Um, so this one shows the actual number, of the, the the money you pay, or does it show yeah. the other side? And so they can do both. Oh, okay. And I just happen to be I have it currently set on taxes. So you know the the sneak the, the part that as you drill in and it highlights a particular uh, property. Yeah. This is the owner of it, their address, and there's another you know seven fields. I just happen to put uh, uh, two down. So this uh, character Edward and Barbara are paying thirty thousand in taxes, <laughs> uh, which is you know just marginally above what the average person pays. There's sort of some interesting things to look at from public policy perspectives. You know. The, the representatives, uh, you know, are you know the worst set by wards. You know, they're they're paying ten thousand in property taxes. They may not understand the pain that other people have. You can see here, there's a chap that's paying one hundred and fifty thousand uh, uh, in tax maximum taxes. You know, excuse me, taxes per annum. Um, so, um, so th things things that cons that consumers might be interested in. You can set up this thing to. Uh, help people locate where they might want to live in terms of sort of uh, price point, you know, per square foot per taxes. So you can optimize where you want to live versus commuting distances to wherever. So I think, think these are the kind of things you can set up. The thing I'm interested in is the the uh, the public interest issue, which is if there are you know 20 percent of the population that gets huge rewards, it's getting all the uh, all, all the benefits from schooling and all the services, and they pay for a very small portion of the cost. And there are others, they're paying very high portions, of getting nothing. Ultimately, those towns will will implode. Uh, pe people don't stick around for those shows. Uh, so that's that's ultimately where I'm driving it to. So currently, the thing we're working on is. Um, Sorry, I have a quick question. So how do you can you tell like which Houses are paying way more than their service. Like, is it, is it the color? No, no, no. That that's this is just the revenue side. Okay. The the way you do it, but it's a little bit of a fight. The main driver, education, educational costs for at least for art for Montclair is something like 60 60 percent of the costs are educational. So if you if the they're not going to hand out this data to me, but where where the children are, you can find it per household. Who is a uh, who's a who's you know. Costing the town a great deal, and who's not? <laughs> and the reason this matters is because it comes into it's not so much to create war among you, because in turn, again, intergenerationally, there's never a problem, right? If everybody stays in town, everybody takes turns financing each other. The place that, that you have issues is we currently have a developer who's a mayor, 
and he thinks we're going to find $300 bills everywhere by doing a massive build out of 2,000 to 3,000 residential apartment building uh, units. And the only little problem with that is that they tend to be very modest apartments and children do come into them. So all it will do is sink this township into more of a tailspin. So those, those are the kind of issues that... Uh, so th I'm offering to the to township uh, to, to let... To, uh, well, they should they have the data and I'm trying to get them to do this analysis. Uh, naturally, the mayor is fighting uh, to have this analysis done. And they're saying it's privacy reasons for you know, where the kids live. I don't need to see the data. You know, they can do the work themselves you know, if they're concerned about safety issues. I'm sorry, is there a privacy issue or is there, I mean, you can find out where the kids live and then you can find out how much their parents are paying taxes? No, 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 the, the, uh, uh, this would be done by the township itself. So in other words, this, this, all, this, this is just displaying already public data. The, where the kids are located, the, the Board of Education already knows. So between the Board of Education and the township, they ought to be able to do this analysis. They don't do dumb uh, policy decisions. Uh, but they're proceeding without doing the analysis. But are you advocating for, for forcing people not spreading it out to people who don't have kids and making kids who are, who are making, making homeowners who have kids in the system, would they, under your thought, would the system be paying more than people who don't have kids? No, 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 no. What happens is that you have to have, uh, because um, uh, because so many of the costs are generated by so few people, the only way the system balances out is if you have 80% of the residents not having kids, so you can spread out the cost so it all stays reasonable. Um, but if, if, if it's too painful for that 80%, they start leaving, and it gets backfilled by people with kids in the system. So at some point, the whole thing implodes. So if you get to the point where 80% of the people have kids and 20% don't, they're going to be paying taxes. You know, average taxes are going to be 40000 And if you compare that to, and we're actually that ties into the data piece we're doing right now. We, we're tying this database to, to census data. So it just shows it's, it's unsustainable. I mean, so it's one of these, it's kind of an interesting Ponzi scheme because nobody thinks at this high level. But once you get these dynamics going, people will try to exit. And at that point, they'll just take massive losses on their houses. And you'll convert some of these, these some of these townships. They, they, they look like they, they'll never, you know, everybody looks at Montclair and thinks, oh, it's a, you know, it's a wonderful town. It'll always be this way. They have to remember that Newark was a wonderful place once upon a time. East Orange was a beautiful place. Policies drive these bad outcomes. I mean, so. I, it's interesting. So I'm, I'm in the town next door, Glenridge, and um, I pay $19,000 in year taxes. And when I first moved in 25 years ago, it was $4,800 um, a year. And I remember we had some neighbors a few years ago, about one, one street to over. One. And the, I don't know, the guy was probably a lot like Martin. And he started doing some of this kind of research on his own. And he basically, mm -hmm. you know, moved out and said, this is unsustainable. I mean, not just Glen Ridge, but I think a lot of New Jersey. Um, what would be interesting, Martin, is for the hackathon, which you're not signed up for yet. I'm sorry. Um, is if you could take some of this data and do some interesting things with it. For example, do some future forecasting based on certain assumptions of, of, of children um, you know, moving in, or, or take some demographics, mm -hmm. um, and then forecast it with, you know, with the, the share of the pot, and, and actually, you know, see what would property taxes be. Um, oh, that's an Excel spreadsheet. We can do that in 10 minutes. So that'll be too quick. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, well, I'll get you. Okay. No, but doesn't a full analysis of this need to include the business rateables as well? Yeah, well, the unfortunate part is that the uh, these townships are, and that's actually the pie, the pie charts that I've taken out just so this thing loads up faster. Uh, uh, I had to color it, so because I have all the data as so the types of uh, business, you know, properties yes. by type, 95% of it, 97% of the, of, of the revenues to these towns comes from residential. So yes, it, it would be nice to have rateables, but these towns don't have it. Uh, I have a question. So I live in Hudson Valley, New Jersey City, and I know that you have one of these straight files for the lots. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to see if you actually have them. Mm -hmm. So if it's clocking right now, is it because you actually don't have any straight files for the lots, or is it because uh, there's some other server issues? I mean, people are looking at the data right now. You might want to help me, Harry? No, I don't. Actually, so, like, do you want to get the, I'll, I'll point to your. Like, well, I was about to find Debbie's house here. We can see oh, pictures. Yeah, sure. <laughs> find my, oh, 
<laughs> no, there's Glenn Rich. You know, no, husband, no, I'm I was kidding. The, I'm one of the lowest rated. Talent. I thought I was bad. I thought I was crying for myself, and then I realized I'm like the poorest one in the world. Yeah, Hudson yeah. County's the white one. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Right. I'm glad it's so, did you see the big one on the water, right? On, yep, this one. Mm -hmm. no. If you click on this way, it doesn't come up. And I think it's because you don't have the shape pipe to lock. Oh, okay. Is that. Is that it's possible. Okay. It's uh, this thing was broken as of last night, so oh, I'm, I'm very happy it's working. Yeah, I, you know, did you talk about how you put this together and the fact yeah. that you got a grant from us? Yeah, the so I went out to yes, uh, <laughs> went, some of it was it, it, but anyway, yes, it's um um bum 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 uh found some kids uh, and and uh, and. Uh, Loaded it up on a uh, Postgres uh, uh, database, which is fantastic. These are um, freely available, and they're great for spatial uh, work. Uh, so, you know, calculating distances. So, if you're trying to figure out commuting distance, if, if you put criteria down as to how far you want to live from a certain direction, min minimize your commute. This does very nice. So, it's all in a Postgres database. It's all on Amazon Web Services. Um, and then I was trying to do some statistical analysis with R. We're having a shaky time of that, and then this is uh, produced with Leaflet. Uh, um, and he uh, did apply for one of our Grow and Strengthen grants. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this Grow and Strengthen program at Engineers Commons Center for Cooperative Media, um, where we've given startup grants to um, and investigative reporting grants. Um, Anthony is here for. From um, Anthony Ewing, right? Yes. And he hasn't seen you in a while. <laughs> he's he's going to be presenting in a little bit in a while, and he got one of those he got one of those grants in the first round. Um, and um, so it's really cool to see some some people actually you know coming up and using the money to, to do something in, in advance, something you know some, you know data visualization and using it in New Jersey and figuring out your own things. Uh, I would say that it, I don't know whether you're planning to sign up for the hackathon. I'd love it if you guys could come and, and, and actually join up and be on a team for two days. But even if you can't, uh, Martin, I'd love to have you as a, a, a mentor and you know to help some of the teams. It, even if you're not personally the coder yourselves, you can help people. We're going to be doing a lot of iteration of like what's the idea. It, I'm sorry, ideation of what's the idea in teams. What do we want to do? And they'll you know they'll be um, coders and they'll be journalists and some hackers and they'll be anacoms. Um, <coughs> But well, you know, definitely the idea of like, well, what can you do? What should you do? Is is, is really you know, kind of an interesting, interesting question. Well, I didn't find you, but I'm almost. Oh, I'm a little kept trying. I, 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 I forget oh, where you live. I'm, I'm next Are you on Douglas? Hamilton. Oh, you're on Hamilton. I'm down. Oh, okay. Number eight. Okay, anyway. So anyway, th this part is just a little bit. Um, <laughs> The weird part about this, or the thing that made me really uncomfortable when there they are, uh, is that you can set this up on mobile. So you, as you know, as you're roll, as you're rolling through town, uh, you know, you know everybody who lives there, and uh, <laughs> you know everything about their house. Right. Uh, it's kind yeah, of a little I scary, I got, but I got the card from my town just the other day that said I paid nineteen thousand. Well, that's an older. That's uh, an older number. Yeah, it's an older number. <laughs> yeah, there's five years of data. Just... So what's the story with the dark blue one? That's another flyer. Uh, right, right this one here? Yeah. Oh, it just no, 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 not even that. The, the, the small one, small, like close to Betty. Like, oh, it's that just one, that was a new house. Oh, new house. Okay. The, one, the one, the one that was next to me. Yeah. Uh, the, the the house had burned down and it was an empty lot, and then they built a new yeah, house. Yeah, this one. Oh, yeah. that one. Oh, well, that one. Hey, wow, that's great. That's modest. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah. to the other 20, 000, yes. this is like a third So one. what's kind of interesting about some of the stuff is is that you know people get very excited about assessments, and uh, and, you, and you can show in places like Montclair that because some what people don't realize when they move into town, so much of the value is the is the educational option. So people like to move into little houses, and they pay up a lot for little houses so they can get their kids in the school system. So they think you know all oh, the big guys live in the big houses; they pay so much less per square foot. Well, they only have you know. They don't have kids in the school system. The school system is what drives all the costs. I got to tell you too that when when there's a reval, okay, in your town, and there you know there was a year or two ago, what happens to show you how information how how poorly distributed it is. If you go to the town website, you don't see a map like this. Oh no no, it's even worse. It's sent it out in PDFs by by cited by groups of ten or fifteen. But they don't want you to see this. They don't want you to see it. They tell you to come into the office. You can look up anybody's assessment. So what people do. 
is they call up their friends. It's like, hey, Roberta, did you get your assessment? How did, how did yours go? I mean, it's like a telephone chain. It's like it's it's ridiculous. And so the idea that you've done this is is really amazing. It would be really cool if you could make it embeddable, so that that each site, uh, site hyperlocal sites could take their town and embed it, and and um, maybe you can do that at the hackathon in ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> I also would like to see who you can, because you've done it for quite a bit of interns. Like your first. Uh, I've not done it for all of it. Oh, oh, it's all of it. Can you actually produce a list of the shape files that you're missing, and we can go after the municipalities and We, in theory, them? had them all, by the way. When, when the best, Yeah, we have had them all. The only one we had problems with, believe it or not, was Newark. Something really? strange was going do on. You have, no. Do you, do you think you actually have those for the CSL? I think I've seen it, yes. You've seen it? Because we, we, we went through all of them. Uh, okay. This was some time back when I had all okay. four kids on board. Okay, I have been hunting for that data. For oh, really? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you on, yeah. on that one. Okay. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll get yeah. it. And if anybody else is not publishing that, because that's the responsibility of municipalities to put the share files for all the lots. Right. So people can do visualization. Correct. We've got a couple questions. We've got well, a lot of questions. Go, go ahead, Matt. So, I mean, I think this is really cool data to have and, and points for comparison. Um, I guess I'm wondering, though, a lot of the, the details about tax assessments and the details about um, how they relate to, and sort of the background details that you've been explaining, um, is there a place on your site or a place where that overview or that context can be um, put together so that people aren't just comparing, you know, the thirty thousand dollars that one person pays with the seventeen thousand that somebody else pays. Some sort of, of um, broad overview of, of how property taxes are used and some of the, the primer on that. Because I, I, I guess one of the things that I sometimes worry about is that we have this very cool data, but there's not this context behind the data. Sort of explaining how these assessments come about, different towns to assess in different ways, um, different time periods, and things like that, and some sort of uh, even you know just a, a, a property tax 101 um, as as <coughs> along with this data. Right. No. Yeah. No. I, I that's where it's going. I, I was actually going to use this front end more as a marketing uh, piece. The write up is it go separately, and a lot of the stuff you have to. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the work is um, is done in the background to, for example, this data does not map easily. It takes a great deal of work to map it to the census data. But once you have the census data, you can say a lot. The same thing, I want to map it to the budget data. But getting the budget data is also another exercise like this. So yeah, it's, it's like, you know, any town, what people don't realize is that every township is sort of like a brand or a product. It's hard to compare. Some towns, uh, you know, spend a lot more on schooling. So you always have to make an, you know, you can choose whether you want to pay a lot or a little, and depending on what kind of service you want to get. Uh, but then you also have uh, school rankings. Right. So, um, yeah, I'm just thinking the contextual data matters, not just but the contextualization of those particular properties. Data, I think, is really important to tell that story. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is. <clears throat> yes. Um, you mentioned like you're getting the getting the notice from the township. I got a notice from the borough with my assessment, and the same week, I got a notice from a private company. I think they were out of state. I can't remember who they were, but they said, this is your assessment. They had the same number sure. that the borough gave me, and they said, um, if you think this is too much, we can help you fight the assessment. Mm -hmm. Where where do you think they're getting this? Where same place. Same data. It's, it's Mod 4 data for the state. So it's publicly available, and it's, you know, it's, it's the usual... That, what's one of the terrible things? It's it's a racket, and you and you, uh, from experience, I know that the system works. It doesn't cost very much to pay these guys, and they just beat up on the assessors, and you know, and you can get your your property taxes lower relative to comparable properties. It's just a waste of time and money, but it's worth it. Um, we'll, uh, let uh, Gina and Angie move in to the, to get your presentation up, and um, and and uh, while you're doing that, Martin can take a few more questions. So you guys are are here. You're in the drive. You sent something to Google Drive, or you got a. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we're in the drive. You want Chrome or Sorry, Firefox? Okay. Got it. Any. Okay. So let me just. So you need to. We need to get the, the drive back up. Okay. Yeah, we have a. 
flash drive. Oh, you have a flash drive. Okay. We can All do right. it either way. Okay. We loaded it in yours. Okay, let me just get that up. Feel free to keep asking Martin Yeah, keep asking while Martin questions while we set up. Okay, my draw day to day. Great. Okay. So okay, so here's your here's, yeah, your, awesome. here's your presentation awesome. and just um, right. so, okay. open any window. open any window in my messy tabs there, okay? All right. Good. Got it. And then just open up a new window right, right here. Okay. Okay. You can close that. Okay. You, you're on the screen. Yep. Okay. All set to go. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's gonna lock me out. Now. Oh God. Come back. Were we in Chrome? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You got it. Okay. okay. And our presentation went where? Oh, and your, your presentation. Which tab? Um, oh, thank you. And there you are. Yeah, you see what makes you Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I just open it? Uh, you, uh, you can, uh, it's not, you can tell because the data is on. And the place where it's on is with, uh, the property, uh, the pilot payments will cover the, 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 the value of the, uh, of the building, but they still pay uh, the, the assessment that's captured by some of the data. So it's really weird because you look at these buildings and they match. So you can look at these buildings. Cool. Thank you. And you can go back to the normal process. I think so. Escape? Escape if I want to get out? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, to start? I'm Angie McGuire, Rutgers University. Um, editor of the New Jersey Data Book, and I'm Gina Schober, also from the Rutgers New Jersey Data Book. And some of you might be familiar who've been in the publishing industry for a while. Anybody used this before? No. <laughs> right. So this this is the New Jersey Legislative District Data Book. It was created 39 years ago by Dr. Ernie Rioch at the Center for Government Services, and it was an effort to provide detailed information to the municipal level about legislative and congressional districts because people didn't know what it was. It was originally conceived as a project to help legislators know who their constituents were in detail. So when you pop into this, here's the 11th district, here's a summary of the district, and behind it would be pages of detail about each city and municipality in it. So the, the, the unit we deal with is municipalities. So it's a completely different look than others. We realized years ago that continuing to publish a book was becoming less and less useful. All of our sources we pull online. It's all public data that we access. But we have a nice protocol that was developed years ago that we have continued to enhance that allows us not only to pull the data, but check the sources and cut it by municipality, then by legislative district and congressional district, so we can um, share it. So last year, we started talking to some of the people in the room who have already seen this before about making this publicly available and online. and. Ta-da, if you go to the next chart. We have it online now. We'll go to the live database, njdatabook.rutgers.edu, njdatabook.rutgers.edu, if you want to log in while we're here. You may have an account already. But what we have in the data book are 11 indicators. Um, right now, we have four years of data loaded. We have all 39 years of the, da the data that we've published. But so far, four years up. So what's interesting about this is that it's municipal level detail. So we're not going down to, to lots, or we're not looking at bars and yoga studios. <laughs> so that's all data that's interesting to compare to it. But we're looking at municipalities. Um, and for each one of these indicators, that's a, there's a set of variables underneath it. It's just under 100 variables that are included for each one of the 565 municipalities. And we'll, again, go live to it to show you. But really, it's a cross cut of different sources. Um, and one of the things that we think make it most useful, right now it's a free database. It's uh, produced by Rutgers University, so that's why it's out there. We have some um, philanthropic money coming in to help us underwrite the cost of converting it from paper to data, but um, other than that, there's, there's nothing really involved in it except Rutgers researchers. Um, the, uh, so the trusted sources piece, if you go back one, 
Um, well, one of the things we like to emphasize about this data is that we have definitions for each one of the variables in each of the indicators. And as you know, if you work with data over time, it changes. And so we're very careful about describing the formulas and the sources from which this data comes so that you can see what changes if you're comparing data over time, which we think is incredibly important. And the protocols that we use both to collect it and then clean it, we'd all like to believe that everything we get is clean. We get election data from the state where more people voted than there are residents in the state, in the city. Um, it's not dead people voting. It's really just they missed the line and they you know, lined it up incorrectly. So many times we go back to the state. We say we found this data. It does not seem right to us. It doesn't look like last year's. It doesn't look like anything we've seen before. It doesn't match the population data. And then they'll say, thanks, and they'll fix it. And so we put it up. So we, we have good protocols. So it's a good check source for you if you're looking for that kind of data. Okay. Um, our sources um, are listed. We've always published our sources in the book. We have our sources listed on the site. We'll show you that as well. But we're using public data. There's nothing here that somebody couldn't get. What's different about the way pre we present the data, of course, is that it's by municipality and it's over time. So it's just a quicker way to get to lots of data about an individual town. Um, and again, our sources are online on the site, the online database. Um, we're working to put more links in so you can get to the raw data, but right now at least tells you to the site from which it came. So what Deb asked us to talk about today, rather than so much about what we've built and how proud we are of what we've done, is how you might use it. Um, and so we've been trying to talk, so we're a big university, you all come from big places, we call all our journalism friends in the school, <laughs> how would you use this data? <laughs> um, and the kinds of things they say when they go through it are, um, what's really useful is you can get lots of data about different things in one place about each individual uh, municipality and you can get it over time. Um, we'll show you also that we have good um, comparative tools. So if you want to look at municipalities and compare them from northern, central, and southern Jersey, you can pick any set of municipalities, any set of counties, any way in the state, and compare them to anything else that you want to about a variable. Um, trend data, obviously, is important. We'll show you how to use that. And it's also sortable online when you're in the database. You can sort it right there to high to low, low to high by any variable or download it into an Excel spreadsheet and then play around with it or create new things that we're maybe not measuring but that you can create an indicator for. So here's a couple examples people gave us. One was when Newark was cutting its police force, one of the arguments that was being made was that it was comparable to Jersey City from almost any economic or physical measure and therefore had way too many police officers compared to Jersey City. This is during a budget cut. This is years back, so it's not a current question. But what you could look at then is just pull up all the statistics on crime, on income, on population, on demographics, and see that there's nothing comparable about Newark and Jersey City when you're looking at what the police force needs to be. So it was a really quick comparison that someone was able to, to make a policy case about uh, the size of the police force. Um, Voter registration and voter turnout, you know, for years we've written descriptions about the consistency of how districts vote and how they've been gerrymandered, and then in the 2013 gubernatorial election, none of it was predictable. I mean, all the jurisdictions that should have gone one way went the other. Um, so just another way to look at your voter registration and turnout. Mm -hmm. And then related to what um, Martin was just talking about, we're going to look at property taxes. We look at property tax rates. We collect them by type of property tax rate. So in Jersey, you know that that big number you get in your assessment includes schools, county, and municipal government, and tax rebates for some lucky people for a total net tax rate. So you can compare the differences in the, the rates, and we'll, we'll just do an example of that as well. Oh, with municipal budgets, <laughs> which is the other interesting part. We just capture budgets at an aggregate level here. We have the data below it. It's not in the database. What's in the database is the aggregate. How does, how does your database compare with what Mark um, Aguiar had done on uh, town stats? So what they did in town stats is they were working to take all the municipal budgets at the major line items of the municipal budgets and enter them over a period of time. You run into trouble because 
uh, towns don't have to report that. Well, they have to, but they don't report their budgets the same way, and they couldn't get all the data loaded. It's a lot of line items. The state has a new law requiring municipal budgets to be user-friendly and online starting this year. So we're working with a uh, division of local government services. When and if the towns comply with that law, we'll be able to pop it in, but I know town stats ran into trouble with just being able to keep up with the data and having enough towns in it. Yeah, I noticed the link is dead. It's gone, it's yeah. Gone. Yeah. yeah, it's gone. So we have total municipal budgets, because what we're trying to provide is comparative data on um, rates of taxes and school performance with municipal budgets. Um, and that was the original use of the data. So that's what got captured over the years. One thing I, I don't remember if you have in there, but it's also useful to include, uh, to include operational details. So, you know, personnel, per, you know, personnel behind those numbers. Yeah, no, so, we don't do that at that level. I mean, so if you look at any of our numbers, what you'll find is aggregate variables, right? So we're painting a picture of a municipality. We're not drilling down. We'll show you crime data over time but we won't show you what block it happened on and where it's concentrated. That's very helpful, but yeah. that goes to his point, which is, you know, like you can have huge budgets per capita in one place, but you're getting huge services. So until you can, and then you're kind of mapping yeah. with Yeah, well, let's, let's, show, let's show you what we got, and then you, you'll see what the differences are, yeah. right? Okay. Go ahead, Gina. Um, so you can log in and create a free account. We do ask you to create an account. Because it's a free service, we have to be able to say we have so many users, it's a good service, so create account, create account, create account, <laughs> um, and use it. Uh, we also track on a monthly basis how many variables are being queried. So not by user, but just we get a report that's created by our database administrator on how many different queries were done by variables. So it also helps point us to what other variables might be helpful to add. And we always take input on what people think we should be adding to the database. And so visualization, very low on this side of this, that's a, that's a to come feature, lots of data. Yes. Okay, go ahead. So once you log in, this is basically our data query area. Go down a little bit. Further. Go there down go. a little bit. Um, your first step is to select your geography. So we're going to take a look at Essex, Hudson, and Salem counties. You'll notice as I check off a county, uh, by default, all the municipalities are selected. You don't have to look at them all. You can look at one. You can look at however many you'd like. So if we just wanted Montclair, how would we just that? wanted Montclair, you can unselect all, select Montclair. Okay. Your next step. Want to compare? Oh, sure. Let's try in Hudson County. We'll go Jersey City. Jersey City. Sure. Okay. And we'll pick Salem as well. It's small. And we'll pick Salem. Step one, geography. geography. Step two is your indicator of the year and the variables. So we're interested in property tax burden. We'll go with 2013 because that's the most recent that we have right now. And you see the ver when you select the indicator, the variables pop up. I don't know right. if you can see it or if you have it on your screen, but it'll show the county government tax rate, municipal tax rate, school tax rate, rebate tax rate for the net tax rate, and then property tax computed as a percent of income. Because yes, we look at it relative to size of house, but it's also relative to percent of income because we also collect personal income data from the state. Okay. So you could determine that by municipality. Right. Yes. Not not to the level that Martin's database looks at it, but just at the municipal level. I'm going to leave property tax out. Okay. So once you've selected your variables, you'll hit search. And these are our results. Can you see that? Okay, so it's got... Um, it's, it's first always going to show you the data sorted alphabetically. Um, but for each one of the indicators, if you click on the little up and down arrow next to the indicator, it will sort it up or down for you, highest to lowest, lowest to highest, depending on what it is you want to look at. So if we go over to county government tax rate, the lowest is Essex County at 0.5, then our, our Montclair. Montclair. Sorry, we're looking at City. You can do this by county. We'll scroll down in a minute. Jersey City at 0.52. 
Uh, oh, you just turned I reversed it. Down. it. Sorry. She just reversed <laughs> it. Now, Salem has the highest county government tax rate at 1.01%. Um, municipal tax rate next. Again, it's highest to lowest or lowest to highest. Um, then the school tax rate. Tax rate is highest in Montclair for school taxes. This is not a surprise to us. Um, it is lowest in Jersey City. Um, school uh, pro rebate tax rate um, is lowest in Jersey City and highest in Salem. So one thing you might, in other words, I think next to nobody will get. I mean, you just can't get information from this. There's no information content in this because the uh, what matters is that number multiplied by a by the assessed value. Yeah. So 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 any one of our indicators is not going to do the detailed crime report, the detailed property tax rate. It's giving you aggregate data, so it does something very different from what your database does. Yes, all, all I'm suggesting is that if you want to, uh, even at this aggregate level, if you want to have some, some information value, you have to you have to multiply those numbers times the assessed value. So, so yeah, I understand you know, how it okay. works. Yeah, thank you. Um, so then the net, we're just showing one thing here to show okay. how to use the database. <laughs> we appreciate it, though. Um, and then the net tax rate rated by by uh, city. Now, if you roll, if you scroll down for each one of the towns that you've selected, it'll give you the summary county data and then the summary state data for comparative purposes. And you can download this as an Excel spreadsheet and use it with other data, either on the site or from other sources. Right. Yeah, you'll see just above this little download button, and you can print as well. So the download will give you an Excel spreadsheet. Or you can just print what you have on the screen here. Uh, you want to talk about the eyes for a minute, then we'll go to another. Can you go back up again to the next section that you started out with? Here? Sure. So, right here. So, we're looking at the, for example, the county government tax rate as a percentage of what? It says percentage. So, 0.52% of what? Assessed value. Assessed value, right. That, that was, value. We do. The actual amount that's collected. Right. That, that was the point that Mark was making that this doesn't show you the assessed value. You can find that in another data set, but we don't right. do the computations, right? Yeah, but you can only have 100% of anything. So in each town, it would be significant that in Salem, uh, they pay twice as much for their municipal government. Um, they actually don't, because what happens is their their municipal values government are so much, their yeah. values are so much right. lower, yeah. and in fact, they're paying a lot less. That's why rich, that's rich communities have lower percentages, I just because their assessed yeah. values are so high. Yeah. Okay. We, we do have write-ups about each of our variables if you're interested in how those numbers came about. Um, if you look under our sources and notes section in the menu. Um, I'll show you what it looks like. While she's looking at that, um, Martin, couldn't you mash up your your kind of data with their data on, for example, percent level, level of, 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 of education? Right, the level of the tax on education. Exactly. And so that would be that would give that indicator of what's going to explode, or what you know what is more vulnerable down the road. So if you're well, and you could also use one of the things in here on population data is the zero to five data, which is the predictor of who will be entering the school system. Oh, over that's time, and that's in that. here. So, so one of the things I wanted to get to, just to jump ahead, is that. Um, you can't yet sort by multiple variables at the same time, but you can pull them all down. So if you go to population data, it's going to give you 0 to 5, 65 plus, college educated, foreign born, uh, all the demographic data. And you can also look at, you want to go to, um, back to the variables. Yes. So you could, down, you could download these, pull them into Access or something like that, and then slice and dice them. And, and yeah, the, 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 the little complication is to get the database to speak to one another, you need the common variable. The key common variable is census data, census plots, and this property data is not that would be not interesting. We could take it at municipal way. level, though. Yeah, you can yeah, take yeah, municipal Montclair. Yeah. Right, you can compare yeah. municipalities. Like, um, where are just you better off using Glenridge or Montclair in terms of tax burden? Maybe the tax burden is the same, but maybe one of them pays more in education. Yeah, look at how it's tax based, based on education. Maybe one of them has yeah, more kids from, from one to five. Yeah, the municipality could, you, could definitely. I've actually done that work. The, the problem there is that they're essentially equivalent, and it's a difference in service. So measuring service is very different. The service. So you you have service indicators that <coughs> right. It it depends what you're trying to do. Right. Right. And you're trying to do something. 
So there, I'm just going to run through the uh, variables that are here. This is the housing indicator. You've got uh, residential building permits and certificates of occupancy, which are a measure of activity around housing being built or not built. A built-out community is going to be lower numbers. A less built-out community has the opportunity for more, but may not be attractive to developers. Um, gives you the occupied unit, units paying rent, which is a measure of home ownership. Um, median rents, average residential property value, number of housing units, number of housing units occupied. Of course, the short communities, very different data points. Um, Percent owner occupied, percent occupied. So, and then if you go into fiscal resources, taxable property value, uh, per capita taxable property value. So these become some of the other variables you plug in to use with the property tax rates. Do you guys have any plans to do uh, add uh, business information with the number of types of you know, businesses that are by the next code? We do not. We do not. We do not at this point. The, the, the things that we're adding right now are searchability over multiple years. Just you can search all years at once instead of because we search year by year now, and then searching multiple indicators by multiple years. So just making the searches better. The Census Bureau has that data, but it's only the county level, the most granular, and being able to drill down to the municipality, the number of businesses, yeah. and see that trend too, I think would be Yeah, it would be economic activity, yeah. Idea. The Census Bureau does have a zip code level file, not quite as rich. Yeah. 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 It's not as easy to work with, not that the county level one's that easy to work with, the zip code one, it's there, yeah. so you know about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, under fiscal resources, we're also supplying the Moody's credit ratings for towns, which some folks are interested in terms of viability of some of our municipalities over time, and you see the trend data on that. Uh, one of our uh, reporter friends said, if you have that data, why don't you put it in the database? And we had it, but we hadn't put it in the database, so we added it. Um, so again, the sources of revenue side, and then the government expenditure side. Um, it's just budget per capita and budget. So we don't go down yet into the detail. When the state goes and complies with the law and the books to have it available, we will. All right. Um, any questions? <laughs> no, no, no. If you ultimately, you know, just speak for, for, for in terms of usability. Yes. For this to be usable uh, to, to me, I need to access your entire database. In other words, I can't go and then search uh, sales questions. That's enough. Yeah. So let's talk about how to get an API for you. Yeah. There's no public API right now. Yeah, I would second that. Yeah, yeah. Anybody yeah. who's actually doing data analysis, you got to be able to skip data. it down. Yeah. I mean, this is great for somebody who just wants to look at the number, like writing an article. Well, you can get the raw data, but you have to pull it down in Excel spreadsheets. That's true. Yeah, but the raw data is there. It just so, so takes more time than you'd like. Yeah, so to I was get actually it. looking at user city crime in 2013, and there seems to be no data. So, like, how do you? Uh, so the 13 data is reported by the FBI. The state used to provide the data in a very timely so fashion. Be there. 12 should be there. 12 is there. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just trying to see how how it actually works. So are. most of the cities did report crime for 13. There are some cities that didn't. As you may know, how crime data gets reported, it gets reported from a local level rolled up to the state, the state rolls it up to the FBI, and at any level in the process it can get stopped and contested or not put into a spreadsheet, just put into a PDF file or an unusable file. So what we've done is, for 13, because we wanted to get it out, we put up the FBI data, the state data is still not available um, to put into a sheet. Oh, I see. I, I think I forgot to mention that you guys are also a sponsor for, for Pac Jersey 2.0, so thank you for that. And also, uh, so Carla's, uh, Employer um, and advanced media is as well. So I'm sorry if we, I don't give everybody the kudos. I give some of the kudos out. But That's fine. Them, so sorry. Yeah. And we're um yeah. Um, you look at the math. Math. Yeah. Just have one more question. So okay. Is also on me, right? Not the not the like the crime or something. It doesn't come down to blocks. Is there or, any plans to actually extend that? Because no. that's more useful than just one number for Jersey City. Exactly. So so this is, you know, much like Martin's database goes down to plots, there are crime reports that go down to blocks. This is aggregate data. And that's really what this database okay. is. Meant we, to no we don't have plans okay. to drill we won't report um, you know, rate tax rates down to lots. We won't report crime down to blocks. Yeah. Not not what this database is. So if you quickly wanted to find out if you were uh, looking for a particular year of data under our features menu, we have this data availability section. 
that basically just charts out for you under each indicator um, the years of, da of data that we have available. Hopefully soon we'll have some more X's for you. <laughs> yes, we have. But there's a lot here now. We're, we're now working to upload um, from the last census forward, so 2000 census. This is really 2010 right. census data, and then we're going back to the 2000 census and the old data. We think the trend data is really more interesting, but we wanted to get it up and test where we were. So I remember when you presented this to our political investigative reporting session back in October. I think Carla said, this is my new, my newest favorite thing ever. Yeah. Have you used it? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I, I've gotten like several uh, data sets, like especially, like I think the, the voting mm -hmm. by municipality, which is great, and I'm sort of like planning on using it on future stories, so. Have you added it to the database that we're collecting for Hector's um, I mean, I can add a link. I'm, I, yeah, like, it, like I don't think like I'd add it to the GitHub since it's already up there and it's pretty easy to navigate. Right. Uh, so one, one thing, um, both both Angie and Carla on our, our planning committee for the hackathon, and I think we were both absent last night because yes. it, not everybody can be there for everything. But one thing that we're hoping that um, some of you can do, and maybe you guys can do it, is we have two what might we statements for, for a hackathon, which is one of the ways that we organize a hackathon is, or how might we? How, the first one is sort of how might we use data to tell stories about New Jersey? Mm -hmm. That's number one, that obviously fits in here. And the other one is how might we build tools for storytelling, community engagement, and you know journalism and sustainability in New Jersey, which is more towards you know, do you want to build an app for journalism? Mm -hmm. And so what we're hoping is that some of our organizers or anybody who's an eager beaver who's, I think you signed up for the hackathon, mm -hmm. um, who has an idea to start writing some blog posts for us to sort of put that idea out there, particularly if you have an idea and you want to start to attract a team. Um, you know, to do what exactly? To, to, to write an idea for what, what a team might do with certain data sets. We're at the hackathon that we're having in, in March. So in other words, yeah. if you, if, if I were Martin or if I were somebody who was inspired by Martin's data and thought of an interesting mashup with Angie's data, I might say, how might we um, use the NJ data book and Martin and New Jersey property report to find out which school districts or which municipalities have the best value um, are, are the least expensive for a good school system. And maybe they, you'd be pulling in some New Jersey report card stuff too. And you'd be looking at all those things, you'd jam them together and you'd create a great visualization. And um, so that's what I'm looking for people to do. Okay. Give me a few paragraphs, send it to me or Sean Sullivan if you know Sean. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Sean will be putting these together. We're just looking for a few paragraphs and maybe a graphic of like, here's an idea. Here's something cool we can build to sort of get the you know, to get people thinking about what can we, what can we do, what can we do together. We're going to have all these great minds. It'll be basically like this. Only we have also a lot of coders in the room. So, um, and if you haven't signed up yet, then I really er encourage you to sign up. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. I was yeah. just in a hackathon. I was on a winning team at a hackathon in January. And congratulations! congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, our, our, it was the International Center for Women media or whatever that, that is, and our team came up with a tool for helping um, women who are being trolled, you know, online, and, 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 you know, it's just a prototype. We didn't really build it out, but the other people, we won. We were one of the winners, and um, it's really fun. It's really fun to be on a team, to sort of take an idea, start, you know, figuring out, everybody on the team, and this is especially, a lot of times journalists are afraid to come to a hackathon, especially if they're not coders. Um, but there was a lot of work for journalists mm -hmm. to do. There's a lot of, you know, we do want, we do want some good coders, and we have a lot of student coders who have already signed, who have already signed up, but we're hoping to get some more professionals like Anna and her friends. <laughs> um, there's still a lot you can do, and a lot of it is at the idea level. So it's like, what would you want to find out if you're in a room with a lot of smart people? And we may have some smart people who can't come, don't want to come for two days, but are willing to come as mentors. Um, for part of the day, and so um, that that's that's something else too. So uh, again, if you want to talk to me afterwards or at lunchtime, which is coming up, um, about more about the hackathon and these how might we statements, um, 
please do. But I think we're and, and people have access to all the data sets in advance. I yes. mean, obviously ours we are, is we public. Are publish, but. We're publishing them on. Go to, if you go to, you can actually open up now. Hackjersey.com, and we we just tinkered with the site and have. Um, it's now what we're showing. If you if you know how to scroll down, okay. There, there it is, and um, actually we don't have the data set. We do have the data sets on the site, but right now what we have is the prizes. You can scroll down some more. The judges um, and tickets, and we do have um, a list of the sponsors. Um, and um, I've got to change that out. You have the data, the data book there That's instead okay. of the center, I guess. Yeah. But. Um, we do have deeper in the site some of the uh, some of the data sets. Yeah, some of the yeah. data sets. We just kind of have yeah, been having a little trouble. Part of the problem is that it's an it's except for me, which is, is a big part of my job in the next month. It's an all volunteer committee. Yeah. Yep. And so Sean Sullivan, who's um, not only engaged in planning a wedding but doing a lot of projects for NG.com, is running the website. So we're um, trying to you know uh, mash together you yeah. know some some. Things. But yeah, we have the data sets, we'll add the data sets to it. But yeah, it would really Because then we can do the meshing around ahead of time too. Yes, to exactly. Feed the that's conversation. what we want to do. Yeah. Alright, so we're gonna kick you out of the of you got the it. drive here. Uh but they're around for a little while longer and we're going to get uh Dave Shangle up and you're gonna change the uh, <laughs> drive. And TJ, who I never introduced, right? TJ is the very Hello, talented um is my, cameraman um, and he, he normally comes in. Um, and you know, with a big it should, yeah. Time it to do a lot of, uh, a lot of all goes according to plan. A tiny camera. A tiny camera. That's pretty good camera. Did you see that? <coughs> Did you see that? Yeah, wow. Where are these? Um, yeah? Oh, you're in When I scroll on the PowerPoint, I can see you've got like the window for a uh, I believe so. Let's uh, let's test it out. Oh, okay. All right. Then I have to do that. Are you getting on these other ones? Yeah, if I can just start with this one. Down should do it. Cool. Okay. Okay. Hey. All right. Tom, you're not going to stay in Heckle? I'm not going to Heckle today. <laughs> this is why I came, Tom, to be Heckle. Uh, we'll Heckle. You're going to the base. You're going out to the ball field. Two o'clock, Tom. <laughs> Um, so just uh, to say, Sheinkold came in late. Dave Sheinkold is the um, talented data reporter for the Bergen Record. That's a relative term, that talented word. <laughs> and um, over the weekend, he did a wonderful story where he found out just how lonely that chairman's flight um, of Dave Sampson was to South Carolina by going through a bunch of data, basically tracking all the domestic flights in the United States, or a good deal of them, to see what their levels of, of uh, how many people were on. So um, we're really happy to have him here today, and he's going to tell you what it's like because you're a sole data team. I what? am the One. lone sailor on the ship. Okay, so without further ado. Without further ado. <coughs> um, I'm here to tell you a little bit, I'll uh, give you a a very broad overview about how we work with data in a newspaper to uh, tell stories, one thing Deb, Deb just mentioned, um, and how we do this as a one-person shop. We used to have more people. Uh, newspapers don't have as many people anymore, so it's just me now. And I am, I do data as the uh, lone sailor on the newsroom ship. In other words, I do computer system reporting or database reporting or data journalism or I'm the house we whatever you want to call it. As one person serving a newsroom full of people who may understand or may not, uh, so 
I'm sorry, what did he say? What's it? What does he mean? <laughs> uh, can everybody see? Um, what this means is um, people like me and others, we are about adapting um, data to journalism, using data to tell stories in ways that can't be done the old-fashioned way, which is telephones, shoe leather, paper, developing sources. That's all still important when we do this. But this is about taking the big world of data, big and small, and turning it into something that means something to people in their daily lives, our readers, those who consume news. Um, and what we do is we build from many sources, databases, updating them uh, frequently, as, as, as often as necessary, sometimes every few months, sometimes once a year, twice, or, or, or twice a year. Um, and we analyze them. There are many subjects, and I'll get to that. Uh, we analyze them in a way that can be turned into words and made meaningful to people. There's masses of data. You've seen some of it here. And what we do is we cross the bridge from the data world to the word world and make it mean something, hopefully. And so what I do mostly is work with editors and reporters to turn the data into stories. So how does that work? Um, I will take, as I said, data from many sources um, on many topics. These, these topics can be demographic trends, uh, taxes, politics, some of the stuff that Martin talked about, some of the stuff that the other presenters talked about. Politics, business, sports, weather, crime, education, infrastructure, it goes on and on, even babies and dogs. Because people like to read about babies and dogs. People also like to read about sex, but we haven't quite figured out that database. Although a long time ago, when before the, the big world of the Internet, um, it was the, the pinnacle of my, my data career was taking uh, a small data set of personal ads and figuring out what people said in them to uh, uh, look at what we already knew, which is that... Um, Women know a whole lot more about men than men know about women, uh, even though we all fall into our stereotypes. But that's another thing. That was a long time ago um, when I started doing this. Just a little background of me. And once upon a time, I was not actually a data reporter. I covered housing and racial politics and desegregation issues. And then I got into this, which was a lot easier. So we take data and develop stories, uh, short and long term. Just the other day, um, I went into a database that I update pretty much once a month. It's a weather database. People love to read about the weather. So we told people what they already know, that it's been cold. Um, but beyond telling people it's cold, we tell them how cold it is. And just from the weather data on the National Weather Service site, uh, we tell people that it's been 10 degrees below normal this year and that we've only had three days this entire month that's been above normal. And that people shouldn't uh, complain too much because there was a day back in 1934 that it was minus 14 degrees. <laughs> this all comes from a weather database. Um, so that's a short-term thing. We may also develop long-term uh, projects, and I'll, I'll mention a few of those um, in a moment. Um, and some of our subjects, demographic trends. Uh, a story, for instance, that I did a couple of years ago looked at how there was a reverse migration from the suburbs to the city. It used to be all about the city to the suburbs. From that we take census data and looked at families and kids and where they were living and how many once lived here and how many now live in the uh, in middle and upscale neighborhoods of the city uh, which are vastly safer or perceived as vastly safer. And so that's taking massive amounts of indigestible census data and go on the census site and try to figure it out. And good luck to you. So we take that and try to then walk the steps towards the real world and turn it into something that means something. So, and if, they, if there's any questions along the way, please stop me. And I'm going to get to the, what Debbie mentioned uh, in a few minutes, the latest thing we did. So where's all that data? There is tons of data uh, available for no money at all on state government sites, the stuff that Martin works with, uh, also local sites, town uh, sites. The tax data that Martin works with, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're pulling that's you're getting that stuff from the State Department of Taxation, your Mod 4 data, or are you getting it from the counties, or because both? Now we, we triangulate. Uh, so it's, it's primarily a state, but there are some some counties like Ocean that's, uh, that, that has it, and the, the deal is the the database the data on the line is dirty. So you have to compare. Mm -hmm. there, so there are many sources of data that is that are publicly available. Um, 
the education department yesterday, we did, they just released their state aid figures for this year. A couple months ago, it's the school performance reports. And again, it's a massive amount of data. We pull that down and run it into uh, various spreadsheet database programs and develop something that's meaningful out of it. I'm kind of getting behind myself or ahead of myself. Hold on one second. Uh, yes, as I, as I forgot to mention before, we'll take these this data, working with spreadsheets, databases, mapping programs, other types of software to analyze it, churn through it, and develop some meaningful trends out of it, as opposed to taking massive amounts of data, just uploading it on a site and say, have at it, folks, try to make some sense out of this. Our job is to make sense out of it. So, as I said, we go to many state government sites, the Education Department, the Taxation Department, um, um, the, the Police, State Police, Corrections Department. There is There are just tons of data out there. Um, the Treasury Department also has property sales. They, when we analyze property sales trends, we'll pull from there. We'll go to the county for uh, property tax data. That's, uh, updated on a regular basis to give people an idea of what's happening in their town, how much their taxes are going up. When there are revaluations, we post up stories that say, John Smith, your taxes are going to go up 15%, but John Jones's taxes are going to go down 5%, and we explain why. So that's what we do. We try to turn all this data into something that is meaningful. Um, there's also data at the local towns and schools. A lot of that is uh, budgetary data. You can also get a lot of property tax data there. Other types of data um, for schools would be how they're doing on test scores. What's the what are, what are the demographics in the schools? What are their teacher uh, student ratios? All kinds of stuff that's available lo on local sites as well as the state, federal government. Um, there is more data than I can get into in two hours here. Uh, and the latest example is stuff from the Federal Bureau of Transportation Statistics that we did to uh, develop the story that Deb talked about. I'm going to get to that in a bit. I'll also use um, lots of data from sports sites, the NBA, the NHL, Major League Baseball, if I'm working with the sports department, to look at some trend over time. Uh, at some point this year, we're going to look at how woeful the Knicks are and how that works out to the worst teams in New York history or maybe the worst teams ever <laughs> and we're going to take tons of data and churn through that and make this meaningful. Um, university sites will get their payrolls and other stuff from university sites or as well as their, their sports data. So there is an almost limitless amount of uh, locations online that we can download data. Sometimes we also order data from government agencies under um, something called the Open Public Records Act or the, at the federal level, freedom of information. Um, sometimes agencies will cooperate and sometimes they don't because they know that we can do cooler things with the data that they, than they can. So uh, we regularly fight with state agencies and as our governor looks to run for president, he is probably and his staff are ever aware of the things that we can do with data that maybe they don't want us to do. So we run into fights um, regularly with agencies who have data that they are required to provide to us under the law, but they may not. Um, and sometimes there are charges up for it. Uh, many times it's free. So that is yet another way we go about getting data. So I'm not, if I'm overloading you with anything, please stop me. You have a question. Yes. How, how do you identify like data sets that you can pull down? And, and what do you do if a data set turns out to question. be in a format that's like it, it's, it's provided as a PDF or something? Um, that's a good question. Uh, a lot of government agencies, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about, will endlessly try to stymie the public by giving them data in a PDF format. There is software. Uh, there's some free software online if your PDFs are not that complicated. Um, there is software that will churn a PDF into a spreadsheet. Um, there's, a, there's a piece of software I use called Monarch Pro. It's a little bit old night right now, but when I get um, a PDF or I get a data set in a really, really, really messy format, that software will turn it into a database or a spreadsheet. Um, but there are also online sites. I'm um, just Google them up, turning a PDF. Yeah, there's Tabula. 
Tabula is awesome. It's you can uh, basically upload uh, your document, and it's very easy to use. And you can, um, yeah, like I, I I use Tabula, and it doesn't cost a thing. That's one of the locations. If you have a PDF and you need to get it turned into a spreadsheet, uh, when you seek data from an agency, it's very important if you do it under the Public Records Act to say, I don't want this in a PDF, I want this in your innate format, whether it's a text file or a spreadsheet file. Most of the data that's now, on, I shouldn't say most, a lot of the data that's online right now is downloadable as spreadsheets or databases as, or text files, and if you're decent with a database manager or a spreadsheet, you can do what's called, as, called importing it into these programs. Uh, spreadsheets now will handle a million rows, a database program will handle more rows than you'll ever want to deal with. Which is just like, and then you compare it to whatever you have. Right. Like problems where they cut off or didn't convert properly. That's a good point. Um, if you're interested in analyzing data, yeah. kind of like Martin does, um, <laughs> when you request the data, sometimes an agency will work with you and you can get it in something called delimited format. That's dweeb speak for the, the data is chopped up into nice columns with various stuff in there, columns or tabs or whatever, and it, it it, you can bring it in fairly simply into a spreadsheet or a database program. Um, some of there's there's a wide range of technical savvy I'm sure here in the room, but there's something called delimited files, and those are text files that will that will uh, crawl into a spreadsheet per, fairly simply. Yes, Martin. I don't know if you want to answer this now, the, the, but it has to do with my sense is that a lot of public policy questions that is mentioned uh, before. It really takes specialized knowledge. You have to have an enormous database, and you have to have a fair bit of time to figure out the whole mess. So I always think reporters are hamstrung because they, they, they need to print. So you, I think there's an overlay on top of because what I see from reporters is really heroic, but really flying, flying, I'm gonna, really light. That was the, one of the next points I was going to make, um, especially as the lone sailor on my ship. I have to know how, think, I'm always constantly thinking and working with reporters about how to walk the plank from the data to the newspaper, which involves knowing your newsroom or your workplace as well as your market. What type of things are your readers interested in? Around here, people, aside from babies, dogs and, dogs and sex, people want to know about their property taxes. They're stuck in their traffic all the time. They want to know about um, uh, uh, the, 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 the most dangerous intersections for traffic. They might want to know about the conditions of their bridges. Um, pro property, uh, property values are always prominent in people's minds. Demographic shift, there's sensitivity in uh, ethnic and racial changes here. So, as well as public schools, people are moving here because public schools are great or they're perceived to be great. So, as somebody in my position is building databases, there's a constant thought of, okay, What's, how can I turn this into an actual arc? I'm not there just to build data sets. Some people get lost in the quicksand in what I do and never emerge with anything. They just, just get sucked down the vortex, hmm. building lots of databases, and nothing ever happens with them. So there's a constant thought of, okay, what am I going to do with this data to mean something? If I download a year's worth of property sales, okay, well, I can build that into previous years and show people neighborhood by neighborhood or town by town or county by county how the property values are going, how the property taxes are changing. So there's a constant thought of, okay, what's in this data? If I go into this data, I may not, I may spin my wheels a little bit with idea one, but I know between idea one, two, three, and four, something's going to happen. And that's important in the newsroom setting these days because our staffs are shrinking, and so we don't have a whole lot of time to flail about and figure out what might be in a database. So each time I get a database, I'm thinking, is this going to end up in a story? And I, you know, after I've been doing this for a while, I know that, yeah, I get this data. It's going to end up in some type of story. Where it might not end up with the exact idea that I start with, but something's going to come out of it, and that's an important thing. Does that answer your question? No, I guess I just have uh, well, my pet theory is that the 
that talking to Jenny and other people that are interested in building up uh, public interest sites, that there really should be there should be funding for dedicated folks that do the data work and feed all the local folks. Because the local folks will never get on top of these data. It's just too onerous a task. So somehow we have to fund specialized uh, data nubs. Uh, I mean, I can do it, but I'm just throwing away my time. But <laughs> it's, and that's right. the only way to. That would be fabulous. Um, it's for people who are involved in the community or uh, are looking to tell their own stories. Some type of yeah, sure, some type of site that guides them through the process or where data is and what they can do with it. Yeah, I mean, that would be great. Not mo most people aren't going to do that. They're going to depend on others to do it, so, like they depend on us. But you know, the more the more the merrier as far as that goes. So some of the possibilities that we've done recently, and I'll show you an example, uh, high-priced hospitals. I think I have. This was a story I worked with our health reporter looking at data from the Center for Centers for Medicaid and something on Centers for Medicaid, blah, 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 looking at uh, what different hospitals charge for different procedures, and we determined that New Jersey is among the priciest, and there are some hospitals in this area that have gone private in some ways that have the highest charges of any hospitals in the country, especially the one in Bayonne, I believe. Um, so that's one example. Um, and I'll go through. Excuse me, but there were two authors on that piece, right? So yeah. what was the other author's input? Lindy is our health writer. She wrote the story. Most of what I do is working with reporters um, who are then writing the stories. I'll help them write the story. Sometimes I write my own stuff. I didn't and get any. And you have to pitch the story to them? Usually I will go out to them and say, listen, I have this data set. This is what we can do with it, and sometimes they bite, and sometimes they don't. Um, but I'm building and I'm building and updating and maintaining dozens of databases, mm -hmm. and I'm preaching the gospel out to the newsroom editors, so they know I'm there. And sometimes it comes comes to me also. People say, "Do you have data on this?" I oh, say, "Well, yes," okay. or I'll say, "No, I'm sorry, we don't." Uh, more often than not, the, the answer is yes, and here's what we can do with it. So um, there's a there's a back and forth. Most of what I'm doing is going out to the newsroom because people in the newsroom, they're word people and they're not numbers and, and so I'm going out to them and saying this is what I can do with it. So that's one of the stories. Um, there, we, we have an enormous database of every traffic ticket that's been issued in, in the state for some period of time. We did a story recently on when traffic tickets spike. Property tax and home sales stuff, stuff, I mentioned that. There was, with census data, we, we looked at a very interesting story about black residents who are moving back down south in kind of a re-migration as the south becomes a little less, uh, um, a, a little more open um, to racial diversity. And it becomes so expensive to live on this. Uh, up in this area, you have a significant re-migration of black families back down to the south where they where they originally came from and where they still have relatives to the, to the south of the country to the southern part to the southeast mainly and also yeah mainly in the southeast all right, all right. not south jersey not south jersey no <laughs> southern states from uh, louisiana across to georgia yeah, south carolina did, north carolina a, this, just seeing this list makes me realize and we did a we did a training on this um, uh, a while back about archives cuz you've got all this stuff that that was published when it was published but can anybody how easily find it now, and it's something that the record ought to be doing for you, and we all ought to be doing for ourselves, is taking these, these stories that were great and are still great, you know? There, that's a great idea to develop a repository, someplace of database-related stories. I, mm -hmm. I don't know how, I don't know what the public accessibility is on old archives on our site. I'm not sure. Right. Um, I just go to one of our paginators and say, pull me out a PDF of, of some of the stories we've done so I can show in this presentation. Right. I'm not, I, I don't know what the level of archiving and access to the public is on our site. It would be an interesting thing to do either, you know, for your own individual brands or to create even, you know, like some kind of a, um, something for the Hack Jersey site that just had like a gallery of great visualizations that are done by all the teams. Carlos' team does a ton of stuff. Now, do you have any graphics and interactive people on your team? When I was going to get to that, when when once I do my job, then I go over to our graphics department, and they'll develop graphics for the paper as well as the newspaper. Although recently, I've been working with some very cool software called Tableau. That if you have some um, fairly basic database knowledge and understanding of how databases work you can develop your own interactive graphics. I'm not going to have time to show any here, 
Um, but, and I've really just been learning this over the last year, uh, we'll run up on our website um, a uh, charts or bar charts or line charts or other types of graphics with photos that allow people to click on something and get an idea of what's going on with whatever you click on. In Martin's example, it might what he was showing there, you click on a particular parcel, you'll see some basic information. Tableau will do that also, and it'll do a whole bunch of other stuff. We might be able to, to take the property taxes as well as the recent sales and run that up. You can do that on other sites, but that's just one example. So we're also doing more interactive stuff as we go along within you know the confines of a one-person ship. A uh, couple of the other, we'll, we'll do each year, we'll do uh, test scores. We'll show how schools are doing. Um, with public school performance measures, there's tons of stuff to do in there. I got to move on and get to the story that uh, Debbie mentioned before. I run out of time. One other thing: decaying bridges. People people drive here, and people are constantly consumed with what it's like to get around. Uh, with with the our, our columnist who writes about roadways and transportation, we recently did something about decaying bridges. This is a database of bridge conditions that the federal government maintains. I download it. I sift through it. I find bridges where the conditions are bad uh, or whether the ratings of them show that they can't handle modern traffic and then we turn that into a story and let people know where are your where are your decaying bridges and what is the state doing to rebuild them or what is the federal government doing to rebuild them if anything so that's yet another example and some of it isn't really even that serious sometimes it's the not so serious baby names and dogs and this dog Mass on oh, sorry, I'm in PowerPoint. The one up on the right, I'll even show this because the one the dog up on the upper right hand corner is mine. So that's <laughs> I, I get uh, an ode to Bella in there. So this is just this is a light thing. We took a database from the I think American Kennel Club on the most popular dogs, and people love to read about that stuff, baby names, etc. So they're serious, there's not so serious. Uh, one of the latest things we've done is this, this ran in the paper over the weekend. Uh, we've been doing a lot of stories about uh, the George Washington Bridge episode, as well as um, a, an apparent or a possible perk for one of uh, Christie's close um, political associates, associates David Sampson. Being, being investigated by Paul Fishman right now? There is a federal investigation going on into whether this uh, flight from Newark to Columbia was uh, created this route as a special perk to David Sampson in exchange perhaps for other favors. We don't know. That's what they're looking into. So what I did there was go to the uh, Bureau of Transportation Statistics. Is there a browser open on here? Yeah. Uh, oh, sh I lost myself. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can just show. Yeah, she can open. Oops. Oh. Can you uh, go, back go back one? Okay. And I want to get that. I'm not a Mac. I used to be a Mac person, but I'm not anymore. So um, this is what you wanted to look yeah. to? Yeah. Okay. So that's the database. Yeah. There's this site, and I'm just giving you, showing this as one example of one site, Bureau of Transportation Statistics, because there is a ton if you're into aviation, there's a ton of stuff on that. I'm not that into aviation. A lot of it is really highly technical stuff that people use to analyze whether airlines are profitable or which routes go where but how uh, how often but for us this was important because this route was generated and we wanted to know a little more about it so I took the data we're still here and I downloaded it in this thing called a comma delimited file that she was mentioning it and I imported this into a database program as well as a spreadsheet Oftentimes with data, we will use some fairly simple software, Excel, Access, SQL Server is a little bit more advanced. There's a lot of other database programs that can handle several million records. Uh, this was worked with in Access, which is a desktop database. So this is, I'll get to that. The database, this database was a uh, database of um, all domestic flights, how many went, it goes month by month, how many flights went from one place to another, from another back to another by airline, um, and the number of passengers, the flight number. I'm not sure if the flight. One second, because we are running a little bit 
over. Yeah, I'll let I'm, you keep going, but I, I'm going to allow people to go, invite people to get down the food is out, to go get it, and, and you bring it back to your desk. Yeah, if you're starting to fall asleep, let me know. I'll stop. <laughs> um, um, and then this is also going to be the break until 1230, where you have to go to the bathroom and upstairs. But, but yeah, we're way over time here. We're going to give you enough time. Give but, me a, okay, like but, 10 more minutes? Yeah, but, okay. but just let people that's get, fine. feel free to get up. Um, so that's the data set is... Um, the data set by month, it's a tally up of the number of flights, the number of passengers back and forth, the airline, and some other stuff. And initially, um, it comes in and looks like that. Oh. It's, that's a common delimited file. That's kind of messy. And after a few steps, uh, then this into a data. This is a little snap screenshot of Microsoft Access. And so now it's in columns, and I work with it some. And from this, we lifted out all routes that had at least five passengers over a set period of time that this flight was in operation. Um, and then then from there, uh, all flights where there were at least 150 during the time frame, so it's not just uh, somebody Some flying from uh, Debbie's coffee. house to Martin's house. Right. Um, and then from there, we calculated the occupancy rates on the flight based on passengers and number of flights. We found the most and least frequently used flights, the emptiest and the fullest flights, and then we compared the airline and the flight in question with other flights on that airline, as well as flights for all domestic carriers during that time frame. And as we do with everything, we then develop a storyline. And this one was a pretty easy storyline. We knew where we were headed with this. It ends up like this. Here's your story. Export Authority Chairman flies to vacation home on some of the nation's emptiest flights. How do you know he was on specific uh, flights? We do know that. Let's go back to the... For one okay, we do know because um, from other stories we've done that this was a flight, and he even has referred to it according to one of our sources as the chairman's flight. Yeah. So we knew that he was flying this flight to go to a vacation home he has near Columbia, South Carolina, about 50 miles away. And this flight, the question is, was this flight created just for him in exchange perhaps for him doing something for United Airlines? Uh, United Airlines, who um, runs this flight through a regional carrier called ExpressJet. So we already knew that he was on this flight, and, and so then they the question. Canceled the flight as soon as he stepped down as chairman. When he when he stepped down as chairman, the flight was canceled. But I mean, you don't know which actual airplane he was on. We don't, but we know what we do know is that they only ran eight flights a month. One on Thursday, and coming back with a, with a couple of exceptions, they went down on a Thursday and came back on a Sunday or a Monday. And he was on them going down and then coming back. Those were the only flights. So no, we knew that going in. So then our question is, okay, is this common? Right. Is there, or how many flights are there that have this view? And how full is this one? We found out this, this flight is generally about half empty. Some of them were so empty. Some of these flights were so empty, people could have an entire yeah. row to themselves. So, so I have a, a couple quick questions to you on this. One is... And so there's a story. And ultimately we end up with this. And this was... And some graphs I, I noted here. These are some of the graphics, kind of blurry, but our graphics department did this. And if I had time, I would have used that Tableau program to take those graphics, run them up to the website, and people could click and see, get some more information about them. What I was going to ask was, one, do you have, when you're doing something as high profile as this, it's one of the things that I learned at NICAR, we'll talk, we could talk a little bit about NICAR last year, was, you know, you always want to to have somebody else run these stats but to make sure that all your assumptions, right? When you're going through a data sheet, there's tons and tons of assumptions and, and, and slicing that you do and, and sort it. So one, if you're a one-man shop, who does that for you? And, and two, um, do, you go, do you go to bed at night and go, oh, shit, I hope I got that right? Or do you ever wake up in the middle of the night? And three, that is did they ever challenge, did in this case, did Samson, Port Authority, United, anybody come back to you and challenge the numbers on this? Nobody challenged me on this, and that is a constant concern, um, the oh shit moment, um, <laughs> in which after you're all, it's all said and done and the story's done, you think back and said, did I account for that? <laughs> and then you go, oh, um, I'm not meaning to blow my own horn, but uh, no, I, I have almost never had that. The reason is that I make sure to build enough time into my projects so that I have time, A, to go out and reach out and talk to an expert, whoever that might, it might simply be the public information specialist at the Bureau of Transportation Statistics 
who I then call and say, listen, I want to analyze flights, but I see that some of these flights have nobody on them. Is that just them moving planes back and forth? Should I cut them out? Um, to make a reasonable analysis of flights back and forth, flight routes, should I lift, should I cut out anything where I just had 20 or 30 flights over a year time period? That means maybe it's a special charter or something that's really specialized in Alaska. They're delivering supplies to remote areas. Cut those out. So I will work with uh, an expert of some kind, almost all, of the, especially when it's the first time I'm working with a data set. I mean, these are my assumptions. This is what I'm doing with the data. Am I off the wall or is this reasonable? If they say I'm off the wall, or no, this is not reasonable, or this is, this part is, but this part isn't, I will talk to people either at these agencies or others who have worked with this, with a, with a particular data set. And this is what I want to do with the data. Does this make sense? Is this reasonable? And so I need, if anybody who's doing this wisely needs to vet themselves along the way, and then once the data analysis is done, you go back to the beginning and you do it again, and you proof it over and then you do it again. And in this case, since this is the first time I worked with that data set, I went back and did it again and drove the reporter crazy by doing it yet again. Uh, and sometimes you proof so often that you then, after the fifth proof, you get some different result. And you, oh, oh wait a minute, I, I look, how did I get a different result? Okay, I forgot to type this criteria in the query. And then your oh shit moment, moment dissolves. Um, but you proof and you proof and you reproof. And, you know, you do it to the extent you got to. You always build time in to do that sort of thing so that you're not just doing – anybody who's doing this and doing analysis quickly and running up there uh, with one go, especially if you're working with a data set that you're not extremely familiar with, is heading for trouble. So there is constant checking and rechecking. I don't have anybody else at my Carla, newsroom to do that. Team. Bigger? Uh, only one more person. That's not that big. Wait, it's you and Steve, Steve, right? You and Steve? Yeah, it's, it means Steve. <laughs> Sean is not on the team. He just no, Sean does his own investigative thing. Our newsroom is kind of weird, but but Sean Sean doesn't really like he does his sometimes his own data stuff, but he doesn't like do data the way me and Steve okay. do. So yeah, only two people. So so does he twice as big. I does guess. he double check all your stuff? Or you double check his? Um. Well, we mostly call experts. Experts that have Same been in the thing field. Dave does. Yeah, like okay. uh, like because me and Steve also work on like. Uh, different stories because we want to, I guess, maximize uh, the right. data. But yeah, I call all of the experts. I, you know, I tell them this is what I found. Like, is this correct? Like, what should I be looking for? Is there like stuff on the data that, like, if there's some an anomaly, you know, you want to check to see whether like this is an anomaly or there's an uh, explanation for <clears> it? Because I mean, uh, I, I'm usually not an expert at whatever. Uh, I'm looking at, and so, yeah, like that. Well, the essence of what Carl is saying is don't think of yourself as smarter than you are, yeah. and don't be stupid. Because you're a journalist. You're, you're, like, we're not analysts. We're not, like, PhD candidates on this thing. We're journalists, and we need to talk to other people and check just as, you know, right. uh, some reporter. Totally. It's, yeah. hard, it's hard to do. The, 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 the bottom line here is assume nothing, especially yeah. when you're going into a new data set. Yeah. Assume you know nothing, even though you might know something. Um, don't try to do too much, and uh, make sure that what you have done is legitimate. Uh, otherwise, the, uh, the cliff awaits you, and you push yourself over it. Has anyone from the prosecutor's office reached out to your data set? Oh, yeah. No, they haven't, but they're free to go get it themselves, and if they want it, I'll say that's where it is. Uh, so, no, the answer would be no. Um, I don't imagine they would need to subpoena it. It's right there. They can do the same thing I did. <laughs> and I'm guessing the prosecutor's office has somebody who can analyze data, although it never ceases to amaze me how far behind some agencies are and having nobody who can do this, and I'm no, I'm no genius at this. I'm applying almost all desktop tools, Microsoft Office. I'll even work with some other database programs that are just out there. I mean, it's, it's not most of what I do is not complicated. That's by design. There are some data sets that will run into three, four, and five million records. The Traffic Ticket Database is one of them. I'll use a higher-end data set, but you can. There's free data software that will work. You just gotta, you know, know what you're doing. Okay, uh, yes. Not yet, largely because I haven't had time. 
Um, that often that'll involve scraping social media websites. Um, so it's an interesting thought, but not yet because I just haven't had time. I'm I'm literally building and maintaining several dozen data sets that are used regularly and others others that are used irregularly. So not yet, but that's another possible uh, avenue to explore. All right. We, I think we're going to have to call break. People are going to have to ladies room and men's room and okay. grab their lunches at Dave. You can stay around for a while. Do you want me to answer, ask a couple questions? Sure. Uh, yeah, you can answer questions. Yeah. I just don't want yeah, to yeah. Don't feel... Oh, let me get to his question next. <laughs> Go ahead. I would think with the um, rise of 538, the idea of data analysis would be growing in that direction. You're talking about, um, what's his name, Nate site? Silver. Nate Silver. Nate Silver. So what's the question? <laughs> it got that, his ideas in his site and the fact that you know, data drive good stories and good decision making is pretty well, well uh, reported. So mm -hmm. I would think that people like you would actually be growing because newsrooms haven't figured out a way to make money in the internet age. No, no, no simpler explanation, no more complicated explanation than that. Uh, what the future of newspapers is, I don't know. What the future of, of news telling media is, I don't know. People who are growing up now, they don't read newspapers. Uh, or they'll, I don't read it on paper anymore. I read all my news online. People think they should get this stuff for free. At some point, uh, we'll figure that out. Um, but a, lar a, a large component is simply money to hire, to hire staff. We used to have three people at my operation who do this. And uh, Star Ledger had more people who do it. It's, we're running out of money in the news business because people who are growing up now think they should have everything for free. If we knew the answer, if we knew figure it out, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> we 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 yeah, we'd come up with like some sort of news media and you know, like but right now we don't, so <laughs> So that is the unfortunate answer to that very good question. There should be a lot more of this being done. But that's that's why there isn't. Some some sites have tons of money to do it, but they're few and far between. You had another question, Ron. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you give some tips on how you find new databases? You know, because uh, sometimes the database itself isn't as important as the fact that it just came out, and you can write a story saying, according to a new uh, survey, a new, uh, you know, whatever, uh, we found out X. That's, that's largely a function of just staying in touch or getting on to mailing lists of uh, where you'll get a news release, um, or just knowing people who are maintaining various data sets. Um, with the state government stuff, they will, a lot of state government sites will put out a, a notice saying, we've updated this data set, or we have this new data set. Um, and then, otherwise, it's going into that thing called the Google, just typing it in. A lot of stuff I'll find now, just go into the Google. Yeah, type you don't know what you're looking for. Uh, that's a way, to know what you're looking for is a matter of talking to people who know about the data sets and asking them what's out there. I mean, a lot of this, some of it is old-fashioned reporting, uh, calling up people who are familiar with a subject and say, what kind of data sets out there? As well as getting on to lists of, um, to getting get, getting on to mailing lists for releases. I mean, there's no there's no one answer for that. Um, it's just it's just doing it. Google alerts. Yeah, you can do Google alerts too. Um, when when data sets come out or they're updated. And no more questions. Okay, cool. Thank you. Jay. Thanks for bearing with me. But we have any problems with the signal right? If you're looking for data and you have a question, sure. Okay. You can Thank call you. me up. I'm, I'm, I'm accessible. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm oh. have mayonnaise at my okay, hands. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, no, 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 no,
No breaks. No breaks. Are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Do you want me to bring you one? No, no, I'm okay. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just going to basically present like a talk about and just basically be like, this was my adventure. The third Oh, I wonder, you know, if you have a second, you can check to see if be like, if Nick has if Nick found me, you know, these are all yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we'll wait five minutes. Okay. Thanks. Hmm. Okay. So you, uh, oh, you need to find the drive. Drive is. Oh. Um. I don't know. I mean, he he just left for a second. He'll be right back. Okay. Um. Okay. The drive is here. And should be. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then I should. Um. Get rid of some of these many open um, things here. Well, there's. Yeah. I mean, there's. I mean, I usually post them on my Facebook. This is the way my mind works. <laughs> you can learn a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. Another person from what's from, open from on what's open browser. on their browser. Exactly. Uh, applies. Did you see last night's episode of Modern Family? I didn't. I haven't seen it in a while. I did. The whole thing was filmed with iPhones and iPads. Oh, really? It was exactly this. I'm seeing everything on the main characters. Screen as they were going through this. Uh, so, is there a way to do this? Is this you just present from here, right? Or do you have to? It's a PowerPoint. Is it? Uh, how do I advance? I don't know. Oh, um, I think you just do it like this. Oh wait, no, that's there. Okay. Open. Here we go. Here we go. Um, and then it should be you um, present. And then here we go. Set. Now how do I get to? How do you get back to that? Just hit the uh, to go back. To, yeah, hit and escape, and then just uh, open up a browser. And what do you want? Epic. How did I guess? So there you are. Well, I, I don't want to like volunteer for to talk about the 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 Oh well, you can do that. But I'm just gonna see how you toggle back and forth. Is it here? No. Uh, where is that PowerPoint? Where's your presentation? How do we get? Oh, it's on your Google. Is it on the drive? No, oh, yeah, I'm just taking the. No, although we could probably open it. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I know. Is this not yours? I convinced the star because it was some kind of Hey, hold on a second. That's what they do. That's if you just open that tab, that's where I go for the website. That's where your website is. How do get back to the website? Is it down here? Yeah, I have to have this Yeah. No, that gets you back there. All right, let's let's, let's download this. Okay, and then we'll open up the PowerPoint. Oh, there it is. But let's see, PowerPoint is here. Um, what do you know what it's called? Mapping. Is it? Yes, your presentation. Okay. Open. Ethnic enjoy MSU presentation. Okay, it'd be in downloads. Um, MSU. There it is. Okay. All right, there you are. And then this is. Is that this? Okay. And then, again, you'll just go toggle back and forth by going, I think.
Yeah. You. Do you, are you going to be talking next week? I'm going to do. I'm going to start with the presentation and then I'll go live. Too bad Joe isn't here because Joe is better than me at this, but you'll figure it out. I'm going to use the restroom. <laughs> Hey, what was up? Planning to do this, you know, I wanted to do a live stream, and we're planning to do it with this being one of the presentations, that being a direct one, and then we have a white shot, and so I got it. But and then, you know, some people are coming in and how do I get on Wi Fi? Yes, and it's like, hello. And, and meanwhile, we're trying to set this up. And they don't have a laptop. And then, but then when we set it up, we find a laptop so that we can watch it. And we got to set this up. So, yeah, yeah, like, I think I was there for that. For that part. But yeah. Oh, so you weren't that late. Just like five minutes later. So. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was the train. Like, I mean, it says it gets here at 9.50, but... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not the case. No, I think it was just, it, it was just moving very slow. Like, it wasn't, like, regular train speed. It was just slow for some reason. There's, like, no trains were after it, so I was really glad. I don't know. Do you want to get started in a few minutes? Because Nick said that Mark has the key. So I need to go find Mark and then he's right Are you guys 
Yeah, because I mean, I don't think I'm going to need that much for mine. Like, mine is just going to be me talking about two projects and then after, like, having a question and answer thing. Like, like, so, I just, I just want to talk about it. Because, yeah, oh, because, uh, because, uh, I, I forgot that the um, John is presenting after me, so I don't know if, like, it's in a time frame. Yeah. Um, 1 to one thirty. Yeah. Okay. That's plenty of time. I don't think people want me to talk more than that. Yeah, I thought about it. Hmm. Yeah. Are, are, are you doing the engine spot? No, that is not. Yeah, so I never mentioned I was the one that just said, it's nice when they said that. So, Deb. Deb, should we reconvene? Should I start? Yeah. Okay. Okay, everyone, we're going to reconvene. So it's 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 appropriate that the food website goes during lunch. Great, Debbie, thank you. So I don't know how much we'll talk about food during the course of this presentation, uh, but we're eating food. Uh, I'm, I'm Anthony Ewing. I, I launched EthnicNJ.com to find the best food uh, in New Jersey. Uh, and I like to find restaurants and put them on a map because I love maps uh, and because I hate to ask for, uh, for directions. <clears throat> that was the, the genesis of Ethnic NJ. Of course, we are a nation of immigrants. Half of my family came through Ellis Island, which of course is part of New Jersey, no matter what New York might say. Um, and uh, we have a large foreign-born population, uh, which is remarkably consistent. Uh, this is a graphic that just came out this week or last week in The Times, a series of heat maps uh, using data to show migration between in and out of individual U.S. states. Uh, and it's fascinating to me that in the 2012 census, one in five New Jerseyans was born outside the United States. And that's exactly the same percentage uh, at the turn of the century in 1900, in one of those big turn of the century waves of immigration. My own, uh, half of my own family came through Ellis Island in the 18. 80s, so they're part of that other, uh, they're part of that wave. Uh, and we all know that we live in one of the most diverse states in the country. Uh, with the support of the NJ News Commons grant, uh, I was able to uh, uh, add three demographic maps to ethnicnj.com. So ethnicnj.com started with a map of New Jersey where I'm plotting uh, ethnic restaurants by cuisine, uh, and I have a very broad definition of ethnicity. We could talk about that. Uh, we, we can talk about that offline. But I currently have about a thousand restaurants and fi some 50 different cuisines uh, mapped across the state. Uh, but I was able to add uh, maps using U.S. Census data uh, because of the way the U.S. Census uh, collects data, uh, uh, for the record, uh, I'm an attorney, a law professor, a business consultant. I am not a data person. Um, uh, the way the census collects data, there are a lot of issues. I had to do three different maps to capture uh, the demographics. Uh, there's an ancestry map, 
what individuals report as their family ancestry. Uh, there's a Hispanic and Asian ancestry map because the U.S. Census uses a kind of confusing definition where they mix race and ethnicity in some cases. Uh, and then there's a, uh, a place of birth uh, map. Um, however, using the data, I was able to provide information for all of New Jersey's 21 counties and for 570 uh, individual towns. Uh, the source data, I, I gather that some of you are familiar with the census uh, data sets. There's the decennial uh, census. There's also the American Community Survey, uh, which does a, a sort of running estimate over uh, one, I think it's one, three, and five-year estimates. For my purposes, I use the five-year estimate, so the data set that I'm using is uh, 2008 to 2012. For the statisticians and the quantitative people, there are all kinds of problems in these numbers. Really high margins of error for very small sample sizes, particularly municipalities with small populations. Uh, the census data is uh, collected about family ancestry, uh, is self-reported, and suffers from confusing definitions and, and categorizations, ancestry versus race. For example, many people fit into multiple categories, so the, the totals are larger than the actual population. Uh, but for my purposes, which is simply to illustrate graphically uh, New Jersey's ethnic diversity, um, it gives you uh, enough information uh, to be directionally correct with all those, uh, all those numerical caveats. Uh, the process, and I'll just... Uh, summarize this. So you get the Excel download from the census site. I turn that over to my uh, developer and he fused it with our existing maps. So I have a WordPress site. We're using a Google Maps API to create the New Jersey map. Um, and uh, according to my developer, uh, he used Google Fusion tables uh, to marry the census data with the Google map. And I'm told that the key to this is the GOID uh, section, uh, which is the universal sort of allows you to locate and sort uh, by state. So in the census uh, site, you're searching by state, New Jersey, but it also goes down to the level of, uh, of county and municipality, which is what uh, I need for my, uh, for my purposes. Uh, some of the challenges in uh, developing the site and, and matching it to the map, uh, because uh, there was the definitional challenge, which led us to create three maps, uh, because for the census, for their own historical purposes, they asked questions about Asian and Hispanic ancestry together with their race-based questions. Uh, they ask questions about uh, uh, if you were born outside the United States, they include Asian countries and Latin American countries um, and Spain in a full list. Um, uh, so there are, there, there are a number of issues. Some of the challenges were uh, based on the numbers that came back, how to set this, uh, how to set the key um, there's a there's a uh, there's a couple of things you can do, and I'll, we'll go to the site in a second. So I can you can toggle between a, a county view and a municipality by municipality or a city by city view. Uh, depending on the map, you can select the ancestry group or the country of origin that you're searching for. Uh, one of the uh, one of the developing challenges was. Uh, with these Google Fusion tables, you can only categorize into five color-coded categories, and no color counts as a category. So I had five choices as to how to uh, set the thresholds for different colors. Um, and you can imagine, if you select Italian ancestry in New Jersey, the entire map would be red, uh, versus, let's say, Haitian ancestry. And you want enough detail so that at some of the uh, some of the ethnic groups with the smaller numbers, you have a meaningful color array 
on the map. So that was a that was a challenge. We had to play around. Uh, we had to play around with that a bit. Um, however, uh, once we got it working um, by uh, displaying the data visually on a color coded map, uh, you get a much clearer and e more easily apprehended view of New Jersey's diversity and our ethnic uh, communities. Uh, for these, this was another technical issue, deciding what to go in the hover boxes. Um, so there's information, um, I learned a lot about, uh, by looking at the way NJ Spotlight does their maps because they've used similar data sets to develop uh, similar mat maps. So depending on what you've selected, uh, you can click on either the county if you're looking at that view, or the municipality, if you're looking at that view, and get the estimated, and I emphasize estimate, estimated population, depending on what you've selected, and the percentage based on the named uh, denominator. Um, so how can this be used? Let's go to the site. <clears throat> Uh, so journalists can use this kind of mapping tool and display uh, to generate story ideas, to illustrate state demographics, and to facilitate uh, reporting. Uh, so for example, if you're doing a story, uh, you know, where are some of New Jersey's first generation immigrant communities? Say you want to see where first generation Jamaicans live uh, in New Jersey. Hopefully this will work. Uh, we're on a city view. I'll take off the restaurant flags. Uh, place of birth. Uh, there are 158 different places of birth represented in the U.S. Census. We go down to, and, and these are the census designations. Obviously, there are a lot of political and other sensitivities embedded here. Uh, Americas, Caribbean, Jamaica. Okay, we'll take this off. We'll zoom in. Um, so, and you can see with the colors, sort of a heat map of where the first generation Jamaican communities are. I live in Maplewood. I sort of had a sense of where they were in North Jersey. I did not know that in Willingboro, in Camden County, 22% uh, of the foreign-born population uh, claims J uh, they were born in Jamaica. Um, so that's an interesting aspect. I did not know that uh, over here near Asbury Park, there's a concentration, there's a, a, a Jamaican community. 18% uh, of the foreign-born population uh, of Neptune. For my purposes, this helps me find good Jamaican restaurants. <laughs> so, so if I put the maps back on, and if I select uh, Jamaican cuisine. This data is as of just last year or as of the last census? So this is uh, five-year rolling estimates 2008 through 2012 from the American community okay. estimate. Okay. estimate. Oh, that's um, I, I'm, uh, apparently the next five-year set has just come out, so I could load in through 2013. So Jamaican, and thanks to this heat map, I was able to go find, uh, for example, near Willenboro, Island it? Treat. Why do you in, call it a heat map? Um, I, because it, it gives you sort of, with the colors, it, it uh, shows you where the concentrations are. Red is, hot, is, is a higher concentration. Right, a heat map instead of just a pinpoint map of, of things takes shows you the density of, 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 of what the pinpoints would be. So you might say um, if there are one to ten Jamaican restaurants, that's going to be a light pink, or if there are ten to <coughs> five Jamaican restaurants, it's going to be a dark pink or whatever. Um, you do it with ranges, and that creates the heat map. Am I describing that right? Okay. I'm not. The idea is that visually, density your, eye can density. See, your, your, eyes, your eyes can uh, figure out color faster than you can figure out numbers. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you say first, first non generation or people just move there? So, so, this map is the place of birth map. So, the data on this map 
are people who were born outside of the United States and where they say they were born. So this is first generation New Jersey residents. Okay. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to uh, ask the question, uh, which county in New Jersey um, has the greatest number of uh, Vietnamese or individuals claiming Vietnamese an ancestry? Anyone? Which county in New Jersey has the greatest Vietnam, uh, the largest Vietnamese population? Essex. Essex. You're going to say Bergen, Middlesex. Okay. If we go to the county view, and we go to Asia. When we go to Vietnam, we can see that it's actually Atlantic County. So what, what did you do? You, what, 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 you, you sorted by all the Hmm? What were the, what were the, what were the uh, so I, I toggled back, I toggled to the county view as opposed to the city view. And in selecting the, pla the places of birth, I selected Vietnam. Let's take off those Jamaican restaurant maps. But just, just to make sure it was they mean something, what kind of numbers are you dealing with? It seems like the, the, the margin of error must be enormous if you have a tiny population. Uh, yeah, it, 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 well, so for the county, uh, the, es the census estimates that the total foreign-born population in Atlanta County is 44,000. And that of that 44,000, 6% uh, was born in Vietnam. Or claims that they were. This is self-reported. <coughs> claims that they were born in Vietnam. I, it, this is not, you, you know. Partially no, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is, and this is actually counter counterintuitive because this is the only Asian demographic <coughs> where the largest population is not Middlesex or Bergen. It's Atlantic and Camden. Uh, and I have learned by going to some of these Vietnamese restaurants and talking with people that this is the result of uh, some of the uh, asylum resettlement programs. There's a, there's a large Vietnamese community in Philadelphia and that has spread <laughs> out from Philadelphia into Camden and, uh, and Atlanta County. So you're not finding your the margin of error causing any major problems with this? I, my purpose is not to, yeah. not to have the accurate number, it's just to get it directionally right. Exactly. And, and I find it, and then I go looking for the restaurants, and my favorite Vietnamese restaurant is now uh, in Atlanta County. Give it that question of, is there, is there any use, you know, New Jersey has all these little post champions about this, is there any use of trying to break up some of the bigger cities into segments like, say, South Patterson, where you have a lot of Arabs and, and Middle Easterners, um, or is that just not worth the time? Uh, uh, Help me understand your question. It, it, it's not worth the time to do what? To chop up some of the bigger cities into uh, neighbors, neighborhoods by census tract. Uh, I think you can go. Uh, you know, this the this the, the smaller you go, the margins of error are going to go up. And and there's a. I think they only go to a certain level uh, for either the one year or the three year or the five year, five -year estimate. Census tract. I'm just yeah. curious. If that's just not worth the time, given the fact. I mean, it, it it will give you it directionally. Um, if you're look, you know, if you're looking to do a story on, uh, you know, where can you talk with uh, Syrian immigrants? You can use Ethnic NJ either the food website, the food map, or this map to find, you know, Main Street in uh, in Patterson, uh, where Main Street in in uh, 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 Clifton. Uh, where you can find the Syrian restaurants where you're likely to be able to interview uh, Syrian immigrants. Uh, let me just give you one other uh, example. Let's switch to the uh, an Hispanic and Asian ancestry map, which we have to do differently because of the census definitions. Oh, when you say you, you did three maps, you don't mean you did three maps and then combined them. You, you well, it, it's one map at three different data sets. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I guess it's the equivalent of, of, of having um, transparencies, like you know, transparent cells. We can toggle on and off the, the views. 
Exactly. So uh, my wife is Costa Rican. We're always looking for uh, good Costa Rican food. Uh, uh, which uh, which municipality in New Jersey has the largest Costa Rican population? Any one, guesses? Absolute, percentage. Uh, absolute. In this case, absolute. Uh, okay. Morris. Oh, Morris Town. Morris. Morris County. County. We're going to go municipality. Here. Linden, Elizabeth. Oranges. Oranges. Union City. Costa Rican. Okay, this is this is this is uh, Central American. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so where is it? Let's zoom in. It's that red one. You have a key that says what the color is going to be? Yeah, it's below the screen. I just have it. This is Summit, New Jersey. So 6%. No, 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 you said absolute, not 6%. Well, yeah, here, 1,435. That's also. What's mapping? Is the red percent or is the red absolute? Uh, the, the red is absolute. The red is absolute. <coughs> and I'll direct you to a restaurant called the Banderas in in Summit. I'll, I'll direct you to a restaurant called the Banderas, the flag, the flags, uh, in Summit, which serves Summit's large Costa Rican population. Just to be clear, most of them live down the hill, not at the top of the hill, but they are there in oh, in summit. In summit. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I know, I know. Brook. We're we're dealing with small amounts. After this is actually Bound Brook. For the right. journalists, Bound Brook. Whenever there's a flood, yeah. it, it sometimes it makes the Costa Rican national news. Uh, huh. so, uh, there is, yeah, there is. You know, I've been hiring a boatload of illegal Latins out of oranges. I can tell you there's many, many more thousands of them. Are you remember when live streaming was. Yeah, but let's. But, but they're coming to the oranges from Summit. They're, they're driving to Summit from. But let's. Summit. Let's. Martin, there's a guy out here who wants to see you. <laughs> yeah. But let's distinguish. Let's, let's distinguish. Costa Ricans, uh, you know, if, if you know some of the differences among New Jersey, Central American communities, you can account for some of those differences. So I'm going to get one Yeah. Uh, so the restaurant part, you are linking to all of these communities? Yes. Are those restaurants that you've been to reviewed, crowdsourced that? How do you get, I mean, I think it would be really interesting to crowdsource out reviews of the restaurants and <laughs> so, so, so I, when I launched this, I explicitly did not launch a crowdsource website because that exists. That's that's Yelp. You got to sort through it. You got to make decisions about who you're going to trust, whose judgment, etc. This is sort of my perspective. Um, to date, I've written ninety percent of the reviews. I've been to about uh, maybe fifteen to twenty percent of the restaurants that are on here. Other than that, I sort of, I look at all those other sites, I do the research, the places that get the best reviews, um, uh, make it onto the map, and I link to other people's reviews elsewhere. But it's explicitly not a crowdsourced, but people can add comments. Can users make suggestions? Sure, you can put, you can make comments, sure. But I, but it's my decision whether it makes it onto the map or whether I go and, and review it. So for example, Show us um, some on the site, some of the, the best restaurants, just as a food site, not the, the data side, that, that people may not know of. That Why don't you do that? Where's your, where's your data on the restaurants? How do you, how do you front in that? <clears throat> Where are you getting your, your lists of restaurants? That's just, uh, you know, web research, driving around, going to my daughter's soccer oh, okay. games. Uh, so, for example, here's the most recent re review I did in. Um, in Fort Lee, uh, if if you're looking for a wonderful warm dish on a cold evening, I represent. Uh, I, I highly recommend a hot spicy tofu stew at a restaurant that's actually called Soft Tofu Restaurant. Uh, they serve this stew and some barbecued short rib, and that's about it. Um, so here it is in Fort Lee. 
Fort Lee is about uh, 43%. The criteria you chose to get that. Uh, research, you know. No, uh, no, no, no. Huh? When, when you looked it up on the map, on your, on, in, your, in your app, like how, how did you, what, what criteria did you use to pull up? Uh, well, I pulled this up because it's the most recent one I, I've reviewed, so it's there on the home page. But if you go to favorites, uh, and there, you can go favorites by cuisine up here. He's basically a restaurant reviewer. That's what, that's what he's doing in his spare time. Yeah, no, I understand. But I mean, like, hmm? in other words, Why would people find you? Uh, organically, through Google search. Uh, you know, it's, it's out there. <coughs> Everybody tweeted out today. If you, uh, yeah, if you, if you, if you Google uh, New Jersey and food, it, it'll come up in, if not the first page, the second page on Google. If, if you put in the word ethnic, it's right there. So, uh, so I welcome people's suggestions. If, if, there's, if there are great places that you love that uh, have not yet made it onto the Ethnic NJ map, please uh, send me an email or put it in a comment. What's your email? Uh, Anthony? at ethnicnj.com. Uh, <laughs> Great. Uh, I'll leave you with that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Carla, what do you, I wanted to show you um, while um, in, in, while you were presenting, one of those how might we uh, blog posts came in uh, from your companion Steve uh, Steve Sterling. Oh, Sterling! I was going to show you. I was going to show that if I could go. What do you have to do to set up? Are you? Oh, no, nothing. I just have to get to yeah. the web. Yeah, get yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So good. Thank yeah. you, Anthony. That was great. I think you got some new fans. Uh oh. Uh -huh. What does okay. Steve have to say? So, I will get this up, and this is his, um, let's see, how might we, so this is going to be a blog post on, um, but this is exactly, so, is you coming up here? So this is exactly what I was telling people that I want, Angie, uh, others in this room who might do it, so Steve is the first one to do it, he covers data and weather specifically as well, so he, he's written this post, he's got some pictures in it. And he's talking about, he's got an iframe thing that will we'll work when we put it into, um, <coughs> into HTML, about what we could do with weather data at the hackathon and how we could use it better and how we could avoid some of the dumb bungles we have when we overhype um, a big blizzard that never comes. <laughs> and so I invite you to, uh, we haven't quite figured out how we're going to display the blog post, with, on, um, but um, I'll be tweeting this out and, you know, um, at least follow me on Twitter, you know, at Deb Gallant and 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 hack. I'm also um, using the hashtag Hack Jersey Two for this for this uh, hackathon. And stay stay tuned to the HackJersey.com website. We'll figure out how we're going to get those blog posts and the databases front and center. But um, I just wanted to show you that so that if you have ideas for uh, something we can do and you can build, um, this is exactly what I'm looking for. He actually gave me more than. I asked for, I, you don't have to be, I, I said three or four paragraphs, he gave me about ten here, <laughs> which is nice, but you don't have to be that, that uh, thorough. Anyway, so I just wanted to give a shout out to Steve, maybe he's watching, I gave him the, uh, the URL. <laughs> Alright, so go ahead, you go, go at it, I'll just, uh, uh, yeah, I just have to... Um, so Carla Astudio. Yeah, you can talk about me while I... Uh, I set up. Uh, she's great on, on web conference calls because she's always eating <laughs> and then hiding. <laughs> she like turns the camera off. Well, because I'm eating. I know. I don't think anybody wants to see me eat. Um, Okay. Uh, so, hi, uh, I'm Carla Cedillo, and I am data journalist at, oh, that's the camera, right? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, yeah. Uh, so, I'm data journalist at NJ Advanced Media, and uh, our work goes out at NJ.com, and also the print version of the Star Ledger. Um, and I, my presentation, I 
basically I'm just going to show you two projects that I did and sort of talk through like what exactly I did and uh, basically I called it the adventures in data journalism and they were adventures and so I'll just talk about uh, the, the things that I achieved like the the difficulties and maybe what I want to do better and what I wish I would have done. Um, so I basically you can it's going to be very you know question and answer. If you if someone has a question, just shoot it out at me. I'm not going to like sit here and lecture you. Like just uh, say uh, whatever you like and um, yeah. So this is all just improvised out of the top of my head. So no plan. Um, so my colleague, uh, Chris Baxter, had been working on this story, uh, which is, I think this is, yeah, this is the actual story, which is a great story that I, maybe some of you uh, have read or have heard about it. Um, if you haven't, please go check it out because it is an awesome, it's a great investigative story. Um, this man from Newark, um, his name is Kenwin Garcia, and how um, he basically wound up being dead at, in police custody and the reason that they gave why he died was something called excited delirium and it's what? a what? excited delirium and it's a term that it's uh, they, there's questions as to whether it's an actual medical thing that can happen basically I think it's if you um, are on like if you're on cocaine or something and have a heart attack it's something that people have called into question um, it's as to if it's an actual thing um, especially if there are uh, are, are docu that basically his whole story is that there are shady reasons why it might not have been excited delirium and it's this whole thing with the state police um, so yeah so it's a great story like you go read it for yourself. Um, so as he was investigating the story and reporting it out, Chris received uh, these, basically the, these the, these documents that, because whenever uh, someone dies in um, police custody, uh, someone has to fill out a form and it's the same form and everybody has to fill out exactly how they died, where they died, um, well, uh, some notes as to like what's the reason of the manner of death, uh, who the police agency was, all this stuff. Um, but they were in paper form and they were in those PDFs that you can't get data out because they're images and when that happens, like there's no program that can, well, there are programs that can try and read uh, images, scanned P PDF images, but they're not as reliable. So, so, so basically, Chris got this document, this massive document of just paper of all these forms that all police agencies fill fill out every time there is an arrest-related death and whether whenever anybody dies in police custody. So this includes suicides, this includes uh, what they call, and this is their term, homicide by law enforcement, which is basically when some like a cop shoots a person. Um, and this was all on paper form in there, and Chris basically just came up to me and my colleague Sean Sullivan, and he was like, what do I do? Like, <laughs> I, I like what can we do with this um, and I was like well we can do a lot with this uh, because this data uh, was very important like this was before everything that happened in Ferguson so like it was months before um, so but I mean it was like obviously it was still it's data that's you know not really publicly available or open um, and it's very hard to get to. So, uh, what we did is we basically uh, just did it ourselves. We did it manually. So we went through all the forms, and we, um, my colleague, made a Google form, and we basically uh, put all the information into a spreadsheet. Um, I don't really have the spreadsheet available uh, right now, but it's like a, a it's on Google. Um, but basically, all of this information. 
and then I built a database um, where you can click on a name and you can see uh, the person, the police agency, and all this information, the reason for initial contact, any extra, this is all from the form. And uh, I basically built it into a very easy to use um, database. Um, so how were you able to take that optical image? What did you do? Just oh, no, no. I, I basically look at a form and then, like, write it down on, oh, like, okay, so yeah, because the, we, we couldn't find a way for um, for it to turn a scanned image into oh, into text. And then what, what, when you say database, is it Excel, Access? C this is, this is, um, <coughs> I used, uh, this is a Ruby about, uh, on Rails app. And I used uh, their Heroku, like the database, it's SQL database, so I don't know Heroku, um, that it, it, and it's up there. And I kind of wanted something a little bit more, because we want to keep this database. And uh, we get um, some new paper, uh, uh, new documents. Uh, we're trying to get new documents every year and add it so that it can always just um, live on site. Um, but you can also download it yourself as a CSV or an Excel file. So wait, are you saying that it's publicly available? Uh, it, yeah, through us. You can go here and you can download it and you can see and you can also search. Um, through everything that happened in New York. I've uh, used a lot of image to text programs and very successfully. And uh, I was wondering, what was the reason it wouldn't work for this? Um, I, a lot of it is handwriting also, because they handwritten. Oh. So it's very hard for software to read handwritten uh, things. I, I mean, I've, ha I've had limited success also with uh, uh, software that can read um, uh, those images. Uh, and it just really depends on what the document looks like. How many records are you? How many people have died in Well, um, I put like a little like thing uh, down here, an interactive graphic. This is just using the data there, and 150 since 2004. But this is uh, up to 2014. Um, I think the I think we included the latter part of 2014. Like some, New York City? no, New, New Jersey. National? New Jersey. Yeah. Okay. Um, New Jersey. So I heard, I heard that that um those that data was not available anywhere. So you may have the first database. Well, I mean, it, the thing is, is that there's <laughs> They cut now. They, they they don't really. The the FBI says that you know that they have the data and like when you go to the FBI website, you see that it's very incomplete because uh, police agencies don't really have to give that data to them. Right, um, right. So the, uh, the the way that you do it is you have to go by agency, police agency, police agency, and ask for this data themselves. We luckily got it just. Through someone that knew someone, um, Chris Baxter has his sources, and they got it for us, and they got these documents. So, I guess my my question about the number of people that have died is is again back to my question about context. How many people were arrested in New Jersey? Or I mean, is is that something that should be on a site like this? Well, this is just this one story and one part of the data. We just wanted to like have it out there and. Um, have people so that people can, you know, look through and they can see, um, you know, we, well, this is the interactive, but they can see for themselves, you know, which, um, let's say, Grizzly City. But the thing is, is that this data isn't all it, it isn't publicly it isn't easy to get. So if you wanted to find out, you know, who, how how many people were shot by police uh, um, in a city or by a certain police agency, you can see that and get that information and and see like oh how many people were and have that more of that context. 
but since it wasn't part of our story, this was just like we were basically focusing on the people that have died in police custody. Um, we just have the database here available <laughs> for people to use. Are there similar databases in other states which would give us some level of comparison, like New York, for example? Um, well, see, that's the thing. Like, this data is not very easily accessible, so I'm not, I, I, like, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I think, I, I forgot who it was. I think it was Wall Street Journal and some great data reporters. Um, could, they, they somehow got, like, some of the bigger cities, and they got the, um, the, the homicide by law enforcement, like, people that were shot by police. They got that information, and they compared it to what they had uh, reported to the FBI, and they found some gaps in that. So there's a lot of data missing and that's not reported. Um, so, and now I guess after what happened in Ferguson, people are very interested in this kind of data. And so to make it open, um, I think, is just like a first good step um, so that other people can go and take it further. and compare it to other things, you know. So Carla, I don't know if this is a fair question right now, but since you guys have the most sophisticated news uh, data operations with two people, <laughs> what are the best practices in terms of hand, you know, because you use things like GitHub, address it whenever you want, you know, if you can later or now, because what are best practices when you're doing data? Is it, is it popping it up on, like, like on GitHub to share data, or is that just a little bit? Uh, I do it. I like to share an open source, like this is open source, this is on my GitHub. We're trying to get a private GitHub account where I can put my code up when it's not ready. Um, but just, just sort of general, what, what do you say is the best practice? Well, uh, there it was. And I was on Google and I totally missed it. There we go. <laughs> um, what do you mean best practices? Like, I... <laughs> I like what like what do you mean like uh, best practices and how to uh, share it or yeah, do you think it's good in, a good in other words do you think it's good practice to, to put when you write stories to put up uh, to, to include data to have data sets be publicly available in other words some people really believe in this collaborative approach to yeah you, and I just I haven't gotten the, the, the handle on that I'm just curious what real people do oh yeah okay. yeah no I completely believe in oh, open sourcing and like having and basically showing your work. Um, there are some good data journalists that are using IPython, and then they're basically putting their IPython, um, their no because they analyze the data using IPython, and then you can see all the steps they took on how they analyzed the data during the story. And then after they publish, you know, their big story investigation, they publish the notebook so people can go back in and be like, wait, why did you analyze that? Or why did you do that? Like, so to show their work. Um, so that's the code plus the data? Uh, that, yeah, that is, the, that is the code that I use to build the database. And, uh, so just like, just like, GitHub has the code. Does it, it also have data? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, this, oh, is, okay, cool. this is it. Yeah, you can put the data on GitHub, or you can put it on the data portal. Yeah. Link on the article. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, I, it, it would be your thing to be, here's the program we ran to do this analysis in Montclair. And if you want it, you can give them the code for all that mm -hmm. to show them exactly what we ran. Here's the data. If, you, if anyone wants to do something interesting with the data, in addition or different to what I did, here's the data as well. Okay. Yeah, like and in the and in. Someone will something really innovative, and then you get they have to give you attribution, right? So I used your GitHub account. I got the data, and then I did something cool with it. And hopefully, they open source their results as well, right? And then just the number of people that can iterate on that gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, and you. It, well, it depends on your perspective. If you're a socialist, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's true. We're not going to make any money off of this. There's also, there's also the argument that that when you know, like, I, I may give up something when I share my data. On the other hand, I may gain something valuable when somebody transforms it into something that was, you know, beyond my ability at that moment. That's yeah. True. Yeah. So, the, the idea to continue innovating on, on open source is, is a great. It's been proven over and over again. And, you know, personally, I think it's awesome idea. We try to open source everything. Yeah. As but you know, then when you go to try to make money on something, right. right, then at some point you decide, okay, this is proprietary, this is adding value and I'm making money on this, and right. I don't want to share it. Right. So, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, we actually just, uh, I watched a video by a Ben
you know, he did a lot of stuff for like hydrants in New York City, how much tickets they made, and it turns out that a couple of spots were actually not, they were not marked like hydrant spot, it was marked like a normal spot, and mm. it, it cost the citizens so like $50,000 a yeah. year. So he, he does a lot of stories like that, and mm. he's always putting a link to open data, and, and mm. or data that he, he, the Oprah, or he got from somebody right, else. Right, right. And he's very much advocating. So I think it's really up to journalists to do the same thing, just follow it and advocate it. And it will spread, it will become open more eventually. One of the things that I found, and I went to NICAR last year, which uh, um, is coming right up, and it's the National Institute of Computer Reporting, um, was is that the the sorority fraternity of data journalists in, in, in New Jersey is pretty small, and 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 but very um, collegial, mm -hmm. and and I think there's a real um, warmth and sharing, you know, um, you know, a willingness to. It will help anybody except the star writer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was pretending. <laughs> Unless it's strong <laughs> bigger, He's bigger than me. You're not bigger than me. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, in the site yourself, you can download it here. Yeah. The, the data, if you so, you don't even have to go to GitHub. Like you can get it anywhere. So, uh, so yeah. So this is one uh, project. Um, and this is an example of, um, you know, Dave was talking about uh, how sometimes reporters bring you the data. Like, this is one of the, those examples. Um, this, I don't know if you guys uh, saw this story, is, um, is, this, is basically, oh, the site's being very slow today. Um, but it's basically... Um, the it, it's the program um, the the Department of Defense program where um, police agencies in New Jersey get uh, these weapons of war these um, MRAPs or guns uh, f um, from the army and they're you know um, weapons that aren't re really used anymore and so uh, they can get them uh, for free and the scroller thing is not working so I can't. Oh. This is the, the tool that the ability is, is when one of us gets a data story wrong, <laughs> so that's the tool that they use that. to come after. <laughs> oh, here. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know why it's not. I just don't have problems with this. Because it's loading all this. It's loading, it's all, loading, all, this loading all kinds of other stuff. stuff. <laughs> I think it's the problem. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It actually happens to... What is now called Fort Newark. What? Yeah, you can. They got. Yeah. <laughs> they, they came after a journalist. They came, at, they came after people. We don't know who they are anymore. Okay. <laughs> they are lost in history. Oh, now it's like all down, like down, down at the bottom. Door okay. Open. Uh, I have to go up. The other way. There we go. Uh, uh, I know. I have trouble with this in the morning when I have to do the news round. Is the scroll like reverse oriented? Like you're trying to scroll up and it's actually scrolling down or something? No, it's the, it, it's I. Um, you can come try and help us out if you want. The problem is that I tend to have more problems on this site because there's so much stuff going on on it. It just yeah, because there's a million there's ads. a million ad plugins and things, and so it just doesn't efficiently scroll. Well. Maybe here. I mean, they don't have to. You're on? Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. It's interactive, and just pre just pretend that <laughs> that we can interact with that. So um, the Department of Defense, they have this program called the 1033 program, and as I was saying, um, they get all this surplus military equipment uh, from the Army. Um, a police department can request it, um, and, you know, they can get it. And I knew that there was a data set out there, and this was back in, God, like April, March. I'm not sure. It was pre-Ferguson, so uh, I was very interested in getting this data, and I um, I got I I asked for the federal um, the, the, because the federal government there they have um, at the Defense Logistic Agency uh, that's where they keep this data, and they have like a very nice lady there um, uh, from Michigan, this FOIA officer um, who was very helpful in um, getting me stuff, but she was like. 
oh, but it's not like we have it by county. And we, well, we have the, the, let me back up. Anything that's not like a gun or an armor or a weapon, we have it by county. We don't have it by police agency, which is not, it kind of helpful, but not that helpful. So, um, so I was basically, well, I mean, wh why? And she was like, well, you know, there's these, these are sensitive information, blah, blah, blah. She gave me the whole uh, spiel. And I was like, well, like, let me have the data. Like, do you think the state, the, the state has to keep this data? Like, do you think if I go to them, um, they will get me something? And she was like, you can try. So I tried. I opened it. Um, it there's an agency, like, I think within state police that keeps this uh, data. And I was talking back and forth, um, being like, I'm interested in this data. And they were like, sure, yes, we'll get it to you. Um, and we went back and forth for, like, because these Oprah things take time. So it was, like, one or two more months. And then all of a sudden, Ferguson happened. And, well, the thing is, is that I had always been pitching this story. And, like, my editors were kind of interested, but not really. And then Ferguson hit. And they saw all these, like, military weapons out there mm -hmm. in St. Louis. And they were like, oh, wow, you got this data? Like, let's do this story. And I'm like, yeah, but, like, like I only have it by county. Um, let, like, let me see if I can get it from the state, like, more detailed information. And when we were going back and forth, I was like, I want, like, each, each law enforcement agency. And they are like, yeah, like, we'll see what we can do. After Ferguson, they were, like, much less uh, enthused to be talking to me. Um, and that is when I was noticing, like, okay, like, I think, because we had to have the story out because it was, it, it, it was right in the middle. Oh, I still can't use it. But it was right in the middle of, you know, everything that was going on. So what we did is we had to, um, I worked with Ted Sherman um, uh, um, from the Star Ledger. Well, we work on the same team, Mike. Um, and he um, basically, he made a few calls, and he has his ways of knowing what police agencies might have gotten uh, some things. And so he was able to figure out, you know, oh, the assault rifles, they went to Jersey City. Uh, but we didn't know how many. They just went like, oh, most of them went to Jersey City. Um, which is kind of... It, it, because we didn't have the data and the state was dragging its feet and we had to have some story out because it was it, it was kind of like we need to hit the iron ore at the top. Um, so we just went with it and I wish I could like, show you more but oh, since it's scrolling. But yeah, but it, 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 we basically had it by county uh, how many assault rifles were... Um, Going up to the Meh, it's fine. Just pretend, just imagine <laughs> this interactive <laughs> map uh -huh. with counties and that you can hover and you can see uh, how many guns they got, how many MRAPs they got, which are, which are like these vehicles. Oh, there it is. And we also had the database, which I was going to get to later, but I'm now... I'm going to also tweet out the link so that people are at, at, with the um, hashtag. So, um, when this story first came out, I went and looked at the, the site, and it's, it's a very cool site for providing all the things that... I mean, I've played around with it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's on it, though, is that some of the things that they got from defense that, that are listed are like computers. Yeah. Or, or um, uh, tables. Or yeah. Or but they, they, like that. They're not all assault weapons or assault weapons. <laughs> yeah, that, they, they get a lot of that stuff, too. Um, we Like, for the story's sake, we were more interested in why Jersey City got, like, a hundred and something assault rifles. Like, that's what we were interested in. But we did have it up. Like, we put it, everything up so you, you can see, you know, like, because um, you could find, like, little nuggets that you never know. Like, it's, oh, this police uh, uh, agency got, like, three computers. You know, like, if you were very um, interested in what your police agency got. Um, so, yeah, so our story, basically, we just had 
the data by county, the first one that came out. Um, and so I got, like, after talking back and forth, uh, the state got back to me and basically gave me the same data that the federal uh, government gave me, uh, basically all with all the police agencies blacked out, uh, uh -huh. so, and just by county. And I was like, well, this is not helpful. Um, and I talked to them, and they're like, well, you can file an appeal. I'm like, thanks. I sure will. So, uh, so yeah, so I did that, and we uh, moved on because... While we were while we were waiting, you know, moved to other stories. So, on back in November, do you have any idea how many people actually go to your, the site and maneuver and look through the data? And oh, that is such a really good segue into what John will be talking yeah, about. Yeah, he'll <laughs> use that. And in five, about five minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll let him start, and and we, that's exactly what he can, he can show us, right? Yep. Yeah. So yay, so this one works. So yeah, uh, basically uh, what happened was that uh, to, uh, to my fellow reporter Ted Sherman um, basically got found out that there was, um, uh, like I forget who it was, but mm -hmm. someone had requested this data through the Attorney General's office after me, and basically the... Uh, New Jersey changed its mind and decided to release this data without the police agencies blacked out. And when Ted found this out, you know, he uh, ba basically asked them, he went to Attorney General's office and basically said, what the hell, like, we said, got an Uber request and we were denied. Um, what happened? Basically, both New Jersey and the, uh, and the federal government, the Department of Defense, quietly changed its uh, policy on this data and did not really tell anyone. Like basically they just they, they basically just reversed its decision and if you asked for it after a certain date you got all of the data, the full inventory list of the gear received. Um, and so we asked for it and then they gave it to us in a lovely spreadsheet form so it was very easy and this is why now the map which used to be like counties you know um, like different counties because we all, all we have is the county data now is by police department and it's a little more specific and that way you can see like oh Jersey City got 170 oh um this town, Mount Olive Township, got 26 assault rifles. What is that? And so, and then we put it up on a database where you can go and you can see. Ah. Montclair didn't receive anything, but you can see. Do they have the right to refuse? Well, they can't refute, like, they have to, this is data that they have to, like, in order to get the, the program. No, the, 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 the items. What's that? The items. You think Montclair actually turned down more? They have to request them. So yeah, you, you, ha you, have to requ you have to request them first, and you have to fill this out, and you have to. Uh, you know, I think in some, I, I, I've known of cases where police departments are offered the equipment. But, uh, but they, they refuse? refuse it. Yeah, yeah some, and. Some have. Yeah. And but then that's not in here because this is an active inventory list. So it's what they currently have. So you can go and see for yourself um, how much how much things they have received. And Carla, it's time for for John to go on. In okay. Just a minute, but um, Carla will be uh, is an organizer of and will be at the hackathon and be playing on a team. I'm not sure if you have an idea or how might be, but. Um, uh, come and, and play with her and, and um, get, get uh, 48 hours to, to hang out and learn stuff. Yeah, so. Okay. Great. And people want to hang out afterwards, after two, when we're done with presentations, that's fine with me. We can hang out and ask people questions and discuss about it. But thanks. Um. Uh oh. 
you changing presentation? No, I just have some notes on here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna... Do you need to get into? Um... Uh, yeah, I have something in the uh, Dropbox. In the, uh, um, oh, let me get it back up. Okay. In the drive. What's your Twitter handle? Oh, uh, Carla dash oh, Carla underscore, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's the main presentation, and then I might jump back and pull up one of these at the end. So okay, so can you do it from here? Mm -hmm. or Okay. Yep. Oh, right, good. Debbie tweeted stuff at me. I tweeted you, yeah. So I think you'll find it there. Yeah, I, if you go to the hashtag just day to day, um, you'll find I think both of the stories you mentioned. Uh, yeah, I think I tweeted out both of the stories you mentioned. Hashtag mm -hmm. what? Um, okay. Do you want what's to the best way to get this into like, oh, maybe this. Oh. That yeah, well, that'll be good enough. You can download it and then open it in PowerPoint. You can do that. You can download it with the down arrow. Oh. And then, and then just click on it. And oh, it's a PDF. Yeah, we did it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Um, all right. So there's nothing after me. So I apparently have no time restrictions at all. So I can keep you here as long as I want. Um, but you wait but, all day. So it's <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll we'll uh, definitely speed through and get to the networking afterwards. But um, so quick introduction. We did this earlier, but for the new people in the room, I'm John Levitt. I work at Parsley Analytics. I do publisher partnerships there. Um, NJ.com is one of our great publisher partners, uh, as well as several hundreds across the web. Um, and as we had such a great lead in, we do have a different take on data, um, but it all fits into the same um, sort of general conversation, right? So what we've been talking about is using data to craft journalism or stories or some sort of presentation to an audience, um, what Parsley does most importantly is take data from that audience and inform back to the people that are creating those stories um, and really telling the story of, you know, what is the audience telling you about what you're presenting to them. Um, so, you know, Outside of that, actually, there's a couple other reasons that we're here, and, and I'll touch on all three of these things, um, first explaining partially in a little bit more depth, but um, we expose all of this data to our customers, so this is a commercial product, um, through an API and through a dashboard. So the API, you know, building into the hackathon, um, we're going to contribute some data that uh, can be used for different hack projects or for internal teams. You know, there's a number of different ways that product teams will build uh, experiences for their readers or for their internal staff off of the data that we're collecting. Um, and the final thing that we do, I mean, we see a lot of audience coming to a lot of different publisher sites, and we do quarterly... Um, uh, basically reports to show trends across our, our network. Um, and this is actually a source for data journalism within the media industry. Um, we have a few partners like Pew Research and like UF Journalism School where we're exposing some data set to them in an anonymous and aggregated format uh, to help them, you know, tell the story of media and journalism um, as it's sort of applicable to those certain audiences. Um, so getting to, is this big enough for you all to see? Um, good enough. I'll explain. Um, so yeah, getting to sort of like what we focus on uh, for our customers, you know, our, our mission is really to help uh, our publishers, our editorial teams understand their audience, uh, engage those audiences, build up loyal readership where, you know, they can communicate their messages um, in really efficient ways. And, um, you know, this graph is just kind of going through the process of a reader finding a story, um, spending time with the story that signals some level of enjoyment, um, possibly sharing it with others, which kind of deepens that relationship and then continues on in that cycle, finding new content, so on and so forth. Um, so we kind of internally call this like the gel equation, um, thinking about growth to new audiences, engaging them, uh, and then, you know, kind of getting to some loyalty characteristics. So the problem, and basically the reason that Parsley exists, is, you know, anyone who's familiar with looking at audience data for their website, uh, you might be familiar with something that looks somewhat like this, which 
you know, how do we get any insight out of it? Um, which all comes back again to this full circle discussion of really having structured data, which is very important to be able to do anything meaningful with it. Uh, if you don't have anything that's well structured, then, you know, you're just kind of looking at this massively overwhelming pool of information, um, and it's really not going to work for you. So um, what we do is we help media companies easily access clear insights about their content and their audience. Um, the structure of the, the data is very specific to the publishers and types of content that we're working with. So rather than just indexing a URL and saying this many people came to it, we're actually parsing out you know, authors, sections, topics that they may be writing about, page types, um, all that type of information which is kind of intuitive to the content itself and structuring the data in that way so that you can look at the audience performance, uh, the audience and, and how that's kind of correlating with different types of content. So, you know, one of the potential arguments here is for spending a lot of time and investing a lot of resources in creating uh, data journalism or any type of project, um, how can we group these types of content together and actually understand the full impact of them? Uh, and that impact can be measured in many different ways. It could be just audience size, uh, it could be time spent. So you may find that you have this you know, data project that maybe doesn't have like a huge massive audience, but the audience that comes is spending a lot of time with it. And that's a signal that it's you know, very important to these people. And, and so um, you, know, you can consider it a success depending on how you're actually defining and measuring success. Um, so there's a lot of different metrics that we'll kind of expose to you to um, help you understand some of those things, um, which I think is on one of the um, next upcoming slides. Um, so for us, really, you know, our goal is to make data a conversation in the organization. Um, as Dave mentioned a little bit earlier, most journalists are words people, not numbers people. So this is just kind of like another parallel, right? How do we get people to understand what the audience is telling them, what kind of feedback um, they're providing? And I think a product like Parsley or other data systems can help inform some of those um, uh, levels of understanding. Um, so once you have, you know, this conversation, it's also, um, you know, well, what do we do with this information, right? That's always, like, the next step here. And uh, I think just having some performance measures is obviously important as benchmarks, but it's also looking at ways that you can grow audiences and, and kind of get exposure through uh, the maximum relevant audience, and, and we have many facilities to um, help our users do that. Um, so just, like, a quick overview of some of the metrics that we'll capture here. Um, so this is important for anyone that might be interested in using Parsley at some point or um, as this data may be exposed through the hackathon project if you guys are involved in that. We index everything from page views, visitors, engage time, device types that users are accessing from, traffic sources that people are coming from, so if they're coming through search or Twitter or Facebook, um, all that's indexed. Uh, audience loyalty factor, so if people are new visitors versus returning visitors, uh, we track social shares, so this is actually a public data source that we're tapping into through the social APIs to track the number of times individual pieces of content have been shared and then what the resulting traffic is. And as you can see, we're indexing all of that against individual posts, authors, sections, tags, um, not pictured here, but also published dates. So you can actually get like a time series of events that happen um, what's the correlation between when an article is published and when it receives the majority of its traffic or how many times it's shared to, you know, traffic. Um, so there's a, yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah, so, I mean, we're both data platforms. Google Analytics um, is one that people also are, are, you know, very familiar with. Um, one of the differences... We're the... Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, so when you think about Google Analytics, uh, I think just jumping back to one of these earlier slides, um, I think it can be a great product for sophisticated analysts because, um, especially when you're dealing with like really large scale, um, it just gets very difficult to set up all the custom variables and create the reports. And before you know it, you're spending three hours just trying to create a report that then it exports into like you know a static Excel file which the end users aren't going to use. So part of it is just taking the data and visualizing it better and making it um, into you know, a workable format. Um, part of it also is that we have an enrichment of data here. So um, looking at the real-time aspects of Parsley, um, the social integrations that we have 
you know, this is data that's not really available on some of those other platforms, but we also capture this historically as well. So if you wanted to look back several months or years, um, you have sort of the best of both worlds to know what's happening right now and what's happening at any time in previous history. Um, and then finally, you know, looking at, again, the structured data part of it, uh, tagging in Google Analytics can just be very, very difficult. And if you get that wrong, then the data is going to be totally worthless for you. Uh, Parsley has a much easier integration there to just map everything about the content directly to how you would intuitively think about it through, um, like I was saying, authors, sections, tags. Um, I'm happy to, to talk after this a little bit more as well. Do you work with public interest sites or for uh, essentially not-for-profit uh, hyperlocals? I mean, is this, just, is this a, something that NJ, makes sense for NJI.com or New York Times, but does it make sense to anybody else? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, so we have, you know, customers of all sizes and scales, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's really about, you know, how we can help publishers in general know their audiences better and understand how their strategies are impacting whatever goals they're working towards. So we do have nonprofits that work with us. We have startups, um, some that haven't even launched yet, but they know data is a critical part of that whole process. And um, so, yeah. Okay, but there's some minimum fee points you have. So you work with a nonprofit, but you still need... To yeah, so it is, it is a commercial product. We do have, you know, ranges and scales, and, you know, we're... we're you know, trying to make that work with everyone as best as we can. What's the entry level point, like the minimum start? Uh, so the way that it works on a commercial side, it's an annual uh, annual fee. Um, there's different variations of the product and feature sets and APIs and things like that. Um, generally, starting at twelve thousand per month. Uh, sorry, twelve thousand per year um, can scale much higher than that, depending on the scale of the business. Uh, and for nonprofits, there's uh, lower level entries as well. Mm -hmm. um, so jumping to the API, uh, we have public documentation online, and uh, again, uh, we're hoping to have some hacks uh, next month with some publicly available data, but um, basically Parsley can help with uh, a number of things just from as simple as ranking, here's the top popular content on the site, um, on through, you know, here's social content, looking at the, the publicly available social data that we're able to, uh, to track, um, and even going into personalized content uh, where, you know, if I'm a reader that's coming to a site and, you know, maybe I've been here before, I'm on my fifth article, this is a way that the, uh, the publisher can actually get to know that person and recommend content that is specifically geared towards their interests. Uh, and this would just be another example of that in practice. Um, so just to give you a sense of who's using Parsley, these are some of the logos that we work with currently. Um, I mentioned a couple others like Pew Research as well. And um, NNJ.com. I think they're on here. Let's see. Uh, nope. Condé Nast. Uh -oh. <laughs> Condé Nast. <laughs> Advanced Digital. Uh, yeah. Um, Cool. So as I had mentioned earlier on uh, about sort of like how we're aggregating some of this data into, you know, publicly available formats that are completely anonymous, if you go to parsley.com slash authority, this is where we produce some quarterly reports. And this is just an example of some of the data that we've looked at in the past. So uh, this bottom left is looking at referral data for, um, and Kind of the really interesting thing here is we're doing year-over-year -year comparisons. So refers to new sites from Google. Main, uh, maintain sort of the same level that they were at year over year, Facebook actually grabbed a 10% greater share uh, while not taking anything from Google. It actually took from like all the other referrals. So that was just an interesting observation and maybe an interesting commentary on the importance of Facebook these days. Um, anybody, anybody can subscribe to this? Yeah. Yeah. It, this, so this is a free resource. Um, anyone can subscribe to it. And uh, if you have particular interest in, you know, what's happening in journalism or media, or even if you have a specific project that you're working on, you think Parsley might have some interesting data, um, you know, we'd be happy to talk to you and see if there's something that we can provide um, that would be really useful for you. Um, that, that's basically how our partnerships with Pew and, and UF Journalism started as well. So, um, yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's that's most of what I wanted to just kind of like introduce to you all today. I think that was fairly efficient in terms of timing. Um, I don't know how much was actually carved Maybe out, but back to Carl <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, feel free to get in touch with us uh, again, parsley.com slash authority. If you want any of the uh, reports that we generate and uh, happy to stick around and chat with anybody that might be interested. Can you explain yeah. how you might be able to 
to use the API um, at, at the hackathon, what, what we would have our data, what we'd have access to and what people might do. And I, I yeah. want to just talk about this is really interesting. Most of the, what we've done today is about data challenges and data challenge stories about New Jersey. But this is where we get to the question of sustainability um, of new sites. It's very important. And one of the things that last year when we had our Innovate Local conference that all the hip young sites like Vox and The Virgin, everything, they, they know their audiences really, really well. And a lot of us who are um, in smaller sites and hyperlocal sites don't. So um, this, this is, you know, uh, while data journalism is really cool and popular, this is a really important, important piece. So, um, and this is sort of gets to the other part of what the hackathon is about, which is what can we learn that can help sustain us in journalism. So yeah. anyway, if you could get to what we might be able to do with it, what, what, what are some projects we could yeah. do with what you give us? And, and I'll just say this as well, you know, certainly love if you could all use Parsley. I'm, I'm sure we're not the right fit for everybody here. Um, I would encourage you to just take whatever steps you can through whatever platforms you have available to learn about your audience because I think it is critically important um, if you are looking to you know, grow and be sustainable long term. In terms of what we might be able to offer up for the hackathon, uh, there's a couple things that we're working with right now just internally. Uh, one would be just an anonymized data set, um, basically almost kind of like dummy data, um, <laughs> consider it that way, just as a way to kind of like figure out what experiences, if I had this type of data on my audience, like how would this inform things that I do, or like how would I want to mold this data to actually understand the impact of X, Y, Z. Um, and the other thing would be just like a massive Excel file, um, which, you know, is not an API, but it kind of functions similarly of some network data that we have. So similar to how we create these um, quarterly authority reports, basically giving this data up to you guys and saying like, all right, if you had this data, like what are the interesting questions that you want to know about? Um, what correlations do you want to find? Uh, and I think, you know, that's kind of like totally up in the air. Um, one of the things that we also do, I don't know if this is something that we could expose necessarily for this project, but we do maintain uh, word count. We do maintain uh, an index of full searchable content. And this kind of like creates an ability for our publishers to actually do a lookup of like all articles mentioning this certain topic across our database. And then what happens with uh, like what is the audience association with that topic? Um, so, you know, it, it could be about, you know, um, what was the terminology? Um, police inflicted homicide? Oh, arrest related death. Arrest, arrest related death, right. Um, so, you know, for NJ.com, they could do a full search of, like, all of their content, find all content containing that term, and then what, what do they see within um, the audience interaction with that type of content? Are people spending a lot of time there? Um, are they not producing a lot of content? Um, you know, are there different <laughs> levels of engagement or whatever the case might be? Um, and I think there's just, you know, probably some interesting analysis that can happen there, if not something that directly informs something that, you know, all of you are particularly concerned with. Thank you. No questions? There was a, um, a hackathon that, um, I don't know, when, I don't remember where or when it was, but somebody was able to find, to create, I think it was a Chrome extension where you could, um, see, kind of create a nutrition chart for what kind of news you were consuming, and it was, it was so that it told you, like, whether it was junk food, it's to, it was to see whether you're reading the Wall Street Journal or reading BuzzFeed or reading, you know, Hollywood sites and stuff like that. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. But, I mean, I wonder if you could, you know, do it by, can you, can you drill down to keywords? Could you, could you test some keywords and you know, to get your national data aggregated in some way that, that it just wasn't revealing to site and just see, you know, yeah. you could do something like that? Yeah, I think so. And, like, partially we're, we're looking for ideas here because we want to make sure that we're offering up a data set that people would want to use. And um, you're going to send some people here so that you could work with mm -hmm. any teams that want to do it? On, on yeah, I think that's the plan. Claire's, yeah. Claire's organizing <laughs> these details mostly, but I, I okay. do think that's the plan, yeah. Right, right. And, um, and Scott also is going to talk in a second. Um, because he is he's another sponsor of, of, of the event and has an API 
and a data set that he's come to share, and they're coming in force to the hackathon. Okay. Um, so um, why don't you, why don't, if, if I can hand it over to him for a yeah. second, go Absolutely. ahead and explain what you do. Sure. So um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're providing content and engagement tools for publishers and, and small business owners. And so our our goal really is to enable the hyperlocal uh, publisher to give them more content that they can put on their site. That generally speaking is really hard for them to get on their own. Um, and even if they can get it, it's really hard to manage and keep it up to date. So the API uh, that we're creating, and we're actually, it's not ready yet. So this is going to be our, our brand uh, launch at the hackathon. Um, we're almost done with it. Is we provide access to things like business directories. So for your service area, you know, thinking about you and your site, um, you know, we have information about all of the businesses across the United States, across all different types of categories, from restaurants to, to service people to florists to what, you know, whatever you like, as well as the ability to add, modify, delete. So that functionality can go on a hyperlocal um, site. Um, we also provide a full feedback mechanism. I know you said you don't want to turn into a Yelp. Uh, but we do provide the ability for people to provide feedback. Um, and then we also provide a whole suite of tools for the business owner to engage with their customers. So all the things that they're doing, creating events, responding to customers, all of that is content that we're making available to the API as well. So the publisher basically gets access to all of that data and then can surface it on their site however they see fit. And so that's basically what the API is. It'll be a read-only API to start, uh, but it's access to all of this rich data that you can then take and enhance your website. It's just the, the private sector, or does it include, like, um, so in my case, you know, there's all these people that are in the assessor business, and then lawyers that are in the assessing business. Do you have the, the county assessor type data? Does this is a public side of your data too? There is some public data. Um, I, I think that the public data is probably less thorough than the private data. But again, one of the values that we'd like to bring to this audience is that we have the ability to, to add to our directory. So if somebody had an interest in, 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 a, in a demographic or an area that wasn't well represented, um, we can add them and then they can show up. So and we can do that in bulk too. So if someone gave us you know, a spreadsheet of all the assessors in Jersey, we could have them all up in, in our directory you know, relatively quickly. How do you get paid? How do we pay you? So we're still working through the business model because we're relatively young. But the idea is, um, and, and you know, the reason I ask. Um, uh, Josh, or John, the reason I asked you about your pricing model is that you know, we're still getting started. But one of the things we've learned about hyper-local publishers is they don't tend to have a lot of free cash flow hanging around. So asking them for money for licensing just generally hasn't, even though they love the idea, hasn't really been a great uh, uh, go. So what we're doing to start is we're giving free access to our content. But we do, we do, we're vetting all the publishers so they get access to a specific uh, geography. Right, so if it were Baristanet, you know, they get Montclair and Glenridge and you know, maybe four or five towns around, whatever their typical service area is, right? We have data across the entire United States, but they would get just relevant to them. You know, you might get all of New Jersey, right, based on your all of your doing. Um, and and then what we do is um, there's additional products that the publishers have told us they think they can sell based on our data. So we give them free access to the content, and then we do a revenue share on the additional products that they're going to be able to sell. Can you give an example? Um, so some of the publishers we're working with now in, in the pilots want to be able to offer what they call enhanced directory listings to local businesses. So by default, you have this whole list of name, address, phone. But if you give me $25 a month, I'll give you a nice page with your picture and details of your business. And you know, there's about 20 different attributes that we can offer. Um, and, and it'll be more exposed. Um, it'll, we also are doing some things with some SEO, we'll call it tricks, but SEO um, uh, enhancements so that local businesses show up higher in organic Google search when people are looking for them. That's all based on engagement, so it's based, it's based on how <coughs> active your page is and how many people are, are communicating with you and how often you talk on Facebook and Google Plus and all that good stuff. Um, but, but if the publisher has it and there's a lot of activity going on, then that business's page, in theory, can rank higher in organic search. And there's obviously value in that as well. So some of the stuff you know we're talking about hasn't been proven yet. So we don't go and publicly claim this to anyone at this point. Um, we're still in pilot mode. And, and the most important thing is that we, we think you know every publisher we've talked to has expressed a desire for this kind of content, but they don't have the technical expertise to build it. 
So our, our goal is to make that available. The real money maker is the, the engagement tools for the business owners, making their life easier, allowing them to be um, to get the word out and engage with the local community. And what better person to help them do that than the local publisher that in general knows that community better than anybody else. And we happen to think that's a really good, uh, we think that's a great op option compared to like a Yelp or a Groupon or a Foursquare, which are all fine and I don't have any problem with them, but they never know what's going on directly in the individual community. And that's where I think their models break down. It's Busyhood, B-I-Z-Y-H-O-O-D. And Busyhood.com is the consumer site. And then we have business.busyhood.com, which is the site specifically for business owners. And at some point soon, hopefully, we'll have publisher.busyhood.com. Your background is? Uh, I'm a geek by trade. I worked at Bell Labs for <laughs> seven years. Okay. And, uh, and then, actually, I was in enterprise software for a long time. So I built a lot of enterprise software products. Um, our whole team is enterprise software people. Um, and, and then somehow got sucked into hyper local publishing. And, and I love the idea and want to really help. I just wanted to find a really, really, really low margin business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I, like hard, I like hard things. No, you know what I, what I, 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 what I like is that, in fact, when Scott first reached out to me, he was the model. If I, you know, I can share this. That model was more just B two B and sort of cut out the local publisher. And I don't know if I was still at Bristol or recently. No, you just started here. I just started here, and I'm like, I don't like that. And <laughs> and, and me and my, my and my people don't like that. And he rethought the whole business model in a way to move behind from the local. Well, publisher. it actually wasn't our intent to cut out the local publisher. Mm -hmm. I just didn't realize how or why we were doing it. So the model that we were trying to go to market with. Um, which was to engage the local business owners, was to get them to come to our site, right? So they would engage with their customers on busyhood.com, and that, by default, cuts out the publisher, right? Because the publisher, the whole idea is the publisher wants eyeballs on their site. So if we're taking eyeballs away from anyone, really, it hurts the publisher. So it became obvious to us. And, and frankly, if we went that route, as much as we have great intentions, we would have turned into Yelp and Foursquare and everybody else, right? Because we don't know the local communities Across the, the way the locals do, and so and so, what I love about what Scott is doing is, in, in um, the reason I want to get more local publishers coming to the hackathon and have not been successful, um, is because, and having been one of them myself, um, they're chasing ambulances and fire trucks all day long and going to meetings and running as fast as they can to cover things, um, but they're not thinking the tech side, and they're letting the Yelps of the world. Um, eat their lunch, as I say. And so somebody like Scott coming in as a developer, and also um, Kenny uh, Katzkorell, who does Broad Street ads, um, you know, which is an ad server, a networker for, for hyperlocal sites, um, they're the developing talent that we need, the tech talent that we need. And, and so this is why, and maybe Ron, you can come at least, you know, to represent. Um, I really want the hyperlocals to come because I, you know, I want to challenge them. What would be a tool that would that would help you, and maybe it's busyhood, but maybe busyhood could also get people to think about something else and get some more developers to come in and, and do something else because it's all great. But these people like me and and the other people that have been downsized from Masbury Park Press and etc. want to start their own sites, but they're going to be chasing all the news and and exhausted and and losing the bigger game if they're not employing technology, which is a lot. Of but in the last point that I'll make on this, which you know, a little bit of a getting out soapbox, but um, I raised money before from venture capitalists. I started businesses, and you know, I've talked to several of them about Busyhood, and, and you know, without fail, they all hate the idea. I mean, they think hyperlocal is a really bad market. Right? Mm -hmm. Nobody succeeded. Cash burned, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, mm -hmm. and you know, they, they they just keep talking about all these failures in the hyperlocal space, and. What I've been trying to explain to them is that I'm not sure we have the answer either, but it's really clear in my mind that these national brands don't know anything about the local markets. Mm -hmm. And one of the advisors to BusyBid is an ex-Patch uh, product manager, and he said one of the biggest problems Patch <coughs> had is they tried to unify all the front ends so that every Patch site looked exactly the same. But the 
problem was all the editor said, but that doesn't make sense. My customers, my consumers in my market are different than the consumers in a different market. So the front end has to be unique to somebody that understands that market. So as we started going through this, we realized, you know, I'm never going to know everything there is to know about Montclair because I don't live in Montclair. But the local public in Montclair know everything about Montclair, including all the businesses and all the consumers. And if they have the right tech on the back end, right, then think about how many publishers there are. So when you talk about a micro market, well, there's think about all the publishers and, and even you know vertical publishers like food bloggers, right, that don't have any back end tech whatsoever, no way to engage with their community. So if we solve that problem, we can solve that at a global level, and we don't have to go to the local communities. The, the local publishers get to win there. And I love the idea of supporting that kind of market and letting the local publisher get bigger because they have more things to offer their customers than just advertising. Advertising is going to lose. You're not going to, you never win that because there's too many people doing it and there's too much churn. And I do agree with that. As an investor, I would never invest in anything where they said, my model is purely advertising because you're always chasing the scale. So there needs to be something else, you know, on a subscription basis that people are willing to pay and get used to paying on a regular basis. So you're, but your part only captures the ad revenue, right? No, no, we, we capture everything but the ad revenue. We're not looking for ad revenue. We let the publisher continue to collect whatever ad revenue they want. What we'd really like to see the publisher do is turn that into a subscription model where they bundle <coughs> advertising with a whole bunch of offer on a monthly basis. So instead of going to the local business and saying, hey, give me $300 for advertising, and then three months later saying, hey, give me another $300 for advertising, trying to convince them why that first $300 made sense. Say, hey, give me $75 a month for a program where we're going to help your engagement in the local community overall. And you're going to pay that $75 every month just like you pay your cell phone bill or your telephone bill. right? And we're going to give you the dashboard and all the analytics and, and all the things so you can see how you're going to That $75 is yours, so you split that. You split that. That's okay. right. So the $75 comes to us, yeah. but then we, we split that with the with it seems to me you're the, the profitable HDL of the business, but you have to organize them actually. Well, that's we're trying to help. And and you know, he's he's reached out to a lot of people in New Jersey and, and in on his own. And um, you know, I, I think it's I think it's really cool. Um, hope that he can you know, win the race of financing and, and time and, and you know, energy. That, that's right and yeah. startup. I think you have to have patience in this market too. Yeah. Especially this market. It's gonna take, you know, a while for it to really and change everyone's perception because local is very set in their ways. Um, but <laughs> we, we think this is a good strategy and we're willing to test it out. There's a way of starting you have to figure it out. Well, you know what? And the funny thing is once somebody does, whether it's us or somebody else, all the VCs will flock to it. There's gonna be twenty seven new startups that are doing this. Right, right. Because right? that's the way it works. You know, search before Google came. Search and everyone's like, search is stupid. Why do we need search on the internet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you yeah, always have to keep that in mind. All these things that, that sound ridiculous. You know, right. Someone's going to solve it, and then there's going to be 20 new startups doing it. So we are, we are pretty much done with the pre-programmed element of the day. And I don't even know if we're still recording. Does it end at 2.30 or does it end at 2? I don't know. Um, but, um, you know, so people are free to leave if they want. And if anybody didn't get a parking ticket pass who came in late, I have some. Okay. But uh, people also feel free to stay, network, drink some more coffee, and some more brownies. So, Debbie, we give that card instead of going to the machine in yes. the bank. Yes, get that card at the end. <laughs> Carla, it's good to meet you. Yeah. John. Okay. Yeah. Firstly, we use that all the time. That's what I hear. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, we're just uh.